body part that you have a tough time connecting to, going intense and heavy is a surefire way to not connect mm -hmm. because the reason why you have trouble connecting is because your body has recruitment patterns, meaning you know certain muscles are being activated uh, in ways where that's your strongest way of, of activating your, your muscles, which means for you, whoever you are who's listening, it's disengaging, for lack of a better term, that muscle that you have trouble connecting to. So if you want to engage it, you got to go lighter, you got to slow down, you got to do higher reps. So I would do, you know, with clients, I would do, you know, between two, two to four sets of an isolation movement, feel the muscle, really start to feel it. Usually it takes a set or two before they can really feel that muscle squeeze and, and connect. Maybe get, in, I, I mean, this is ideal, get a little bit of a pump in that muscle. Then we move on to the big, you know, gross motor movement, muscle builders. Now the person's got the feedback Oh, I could feel that glute med, or I could feel the pecs, or whatever you know, lagging body part uh, that they have. I can feel it now, and I can adjust my technique to now take this really effective exercise and make it work for me. Sometimes one of the best things you could do to bring up a lagging body part is to start your workout with an isolation exercise. I know that's kind of sacrilegious here, but mm. literally, if you have a weak body part, a uh, tough time connecting to that body part. Start with an isolation exercise, then move on to the compound lift. You'll feel it connect more and be able to get that muscle develop a little faster. Well, we know the body will prioritize whatever you present it first, right? So that that's something that because uh, we always get the question of like, when should I do cardio or when should yeah. I, you know? And so that always brings brings that into light is like whatever you present it first in the workouts. That's what your body's yeah, going to focus on. But really, what what it is even more than that is um, let's just say that's your glutes. Let's say your glutes are your I'd say your weak body part. I was just going to ask you guys what you thought the number one thing that you would do that with, and I would probably say glutes. Glutes is probably what that's got to be one of them, right? But you know, let's say it is right. It's it's your glutes, and there's a lot of compound lifts that are amazing glute builders like squats, right? So you might think. Well, let me start my workout out with squats. And almost every well-programmed workout starts out with compound lifts. In fact, if you look at our programs, except for maybe like focus sessions and MAPS Aesthetic or something like that, right? Typically, every workout starts out with a compound lift. And it, that's generally true and generally the most effective way to start. But let's say you have a tough time connecting your glutes. Well, sometimes what you need to do is work them with an isolation movement, which is easier to connect to. So it's easier to feel the glutes when I'm doing an isolation movement. And then what happens is when you move on to the compound lift, because you feel the glutes, you can change your form, you can change your technique so that that squat becomes more of a glute squat, for example. So really it's about that feedback and that feel, less about the pre-exhausting mm. and more about the feedback that you get from feeling the muscle that you just isolated. Um, and that helps with, uh, you know, any can help with any body part you have a, a Yeah, I'm glad with. you brought the pre-exhaust up because I, I feel like people would probably ask that question in terms of like if they go into the compound list, if they already like, you know, went through a, a couple sets of isolation and then now, you know, that that muscle isn't quite contributing. So it's it's less on the exhaust, the exhaustion and, and more of just getting that connectivity. Totally. So I just shot a video for Cassie for a similar thing for somebody who's uh, you know, trying to get their side butt incorporated. Right. So glute meads not firing um, and or it's not they're not feeling it in their butt on one side. It's not being developed as much. And so. I sent over like a little two minute video on like a band distraction, uh, you know, stationary split, split squat, um, lunge. Right. And what would you guys, when you're, when you do something like that, I think the mistake that people make is they, uh, they go into it like they're training, uh, in another exercise and the, the protocol is different, right? You don't want to fatigue the muscle per se. It's, you're just trying to you're trying to feel it, right. You're trying to get connected. So, do you have a kind of generic amount of reps or time that you would spend doing that? So, okay, we're going to get good connection here. We're going to do a little bit of, of work, but we're not, we're not working at 90% intensity and we're not trying to fatigue this muscle. No, when you when you have an, a body part that you have a tough time connecting to, going intense and heavy is a surefire way to not connect mm -hmm. because the reason why you have trouble connecting is because your body has recruitment patterns, meaning you know certain muscles are being activated. Uh, in ways where that's your strongest way of of activating your your muscles, which means for you, whoever you are who's listening, it's disengaging, for lack of a better term, that muscle that you have trouble connecting to. So if you want to engage it, you got to go lighter, you got to slow down, you got to do higher reps. So I would do, you know, with clients, I would do, you know, between two, two to four sets of an isolation movement, feel the muscle, really start to feel it. Usually it takes a set or two before they can really feel that muscle squeeze and, and connect. Maybe get, I mean, this is ideal, get a little bit of a pump in that muscle. Then we move on to the big, 
you know, gross motor movement muscle builders. Now the person's got the feedback. Oh, I could feel that glute med or I could feel the pecs or whatever, you know, lagging body part uh, that they have. I can feel it now and I can adjust my technique to now take this really effective exercise and make it work for me. Yeah. I w so what I recommended was two to three sets, uh, 10 reps. And the only reason 10 reps and not 15 reps is because I also want a two to three second, like isometric hold. Uh, so like ten the squeeze part. Yes. Yeah. So like, like the let's just, let's say we're yeah. talking about a floor bridge for someone trying to activate the glutes, right? So I would have them do ten reps, slow and controlled, yeah. and at the top, they are to squeeze and do an isometric hold for a good two to three seconds, contract, come down, back up, two to three second hold, and then come back down, do ten reps, and then do that for two to three sets before you go into like a big mover, like a squat, a deadlift. You're not just going through the reps. You're really trying to squeeze and hold and connect right. and feel. So it's yeah. important. And once you learn how to connect and squeeze, then you can squeeze and connect in a compound lift. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people have trouble squeezing and connecting to, let's say their lats uh, or the back muscles, especially when they first start doing back exercises with rows. Now rows are great back exercises. But it, it can be tough to feel like, okay, I think I'm squeezing. I think I'm feeling what's going on. But if you isolate those muscles, get them pumped a little bit, get them to kind of feel it with an isolation movement, then they go to the row and they know what they're aiming for, right? They know what they're trying to feel mm -hmm. and it changes the technique a little bit and, and it makes that an effective exercise. Otherwise, you know, there's a lot of muscles involved in these big gross motor movement exercises and they're great at building target muscles, but your body does a great job of, using what it, you know, what's going to be most beneficial for it. And so mm -hmm. if, it, if it's not your glutes and a squat, it's going to be quads. It's going to be, you know, mo your prime mover. And you can see this as a trainer with someone's techni technique, but really it's about feeling it. It's about the person feeling it. And studies will show that when a person focuses on a muscle, even just thinks about it and tries to feel it, you see more activation uh, in that particular muscle. So this is legit. So mm -hmm. another place that you might use this is not just where someone's uh, like poorly connected, but also that you just want to put more emphasis on a specific, like, so someone who's in like bodybuilding world, right? So you're trying to develop, for example, like if you are really trying to work on rear delts, actually getting the rear delts firing before you go do a, sh a traditional shoulder press. Overhead or, press. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that my rear delts are getting more, more work and activation in a movement that it's not a prime mover. I did that for mm -hmm. years. You know, I, um, it's funny. You and I have a similar story with the rear delt. Well, I, I just, I figured it out as a teenager that, Oh, that's the part of the delt that makes the shoulder look round. I don't remember. I think I read an article and for probably 10 years, I don't do this anymore, but for at least 10 years, Every shoulder workout I started with yep. uh, with rear delt flies, and and my shoulders turned out to be a great body part as a result of that. But I had to prioritize it mm -hmm. over overhead presses. Then I go to overhead presses after doing the rear. Hundred percent, I attribute yeah. the same thing. I was and it was I don't know about ten years for me, but it was a good solid three three probably four years of every every time I hit shoulders, it was a rear delt exercise first before I went mm -hmm. into the which is seems kind of, uh, you know, um, counter to what we would normally talk about, right? We would normally tell the average person like, oh, you absolutely would do, you know, your, your front, you know, shoulder press would mm -hmm. be your, you know, big mover for the shoulders. And you should do that first when you have the most energy. But this is where no program uh, that we've ever created is perfect for everybody. And this is- This is the individualization. Yeah, part. this is the part that we, I mean, we had an, uh, a recent caller, right? Guy was, you know, 50 something years older with that. He'd been lifting for- 30 years or yeah. whatever. And he was like trying to gauge like, man, this just seems like it's too much intensity for me to go three days like this. And it's like, well, this is where you, and this is the idea of the podcast is that if you have the programs, you're following them and then you're listening to some of this advice, mm -hmm. it's not that we are contradicting the way we wrote the program. It's that there's such an individual variance in, in, in people that, you know, this is where you would, you would break a, a, a rule, a rule or a, a common truth about lifting. Like you would always tell someone you always start with a compound lift. Well, in, in yeah. case, in most cases, this, yeah, but not but, all, yeah, we yeah. highlight how to troubleshoot your way through a lot of these things. Cause it's not always how you have it written out. And I mean, I mean, like this is where the whole, um, you know, the the whiteboard, the, the the chalkboard type workouts that I used to um, experience with uh, sports training, for instance. Like we would go through that and inevitably hit all these like problems, and it's like, you know, nothing's perfect that you can just have as a standard um, protocol. You have to be able to have some flexibility there, modify it to your individual well, needs. Do you guys remember when you changed that as a trainer? Like, like for me, when I first started. 
I'd have workouts laid out for my clients before they'd show up. Yeah. yeah. And we that was the workout we're gonna do. Come hell or water. Right. Yeah, like this is our workout today. We gotta get through it. Uh and then I don't know, it was it was really short too. It was with like within six months. Uh, I just said, yeah, no, I have a guide, but when John shows up and I watch him move, I'm not doing that exercise that I had written down because I think this one's going to be better right now, or they're tired, or we need to take longer rest, or they got lots of energy. So let's add yeah, a couple things. It gives things. you good structure, you know, it yeah. gives you something to kind of, um, you know, navigate through, but you have to be able to have that flexibility and understand, um, you know, what your body signals are telling you. So totally. it was, it was quite a while into my career before I think I really pieced it together. In fact, I think it was after I went through, um, corrective exercise specialist. And that was what made me start thinking like, oh, wow, like, okay, yeah, these exercises that I, I have laid out for my clients is ideal for building muscle or burning body fat. But I'm not addressing all these imbalances yeah. or issues and chronic pain. And and by this time I'm I'm I've realized like man, most all my clients suffer from some sort of chronic pain and yes, they also want to lose 30 pounds or build 10 pounds of muscle, but yeah. I really need to be finding ways to address that and then that's where I really started to modify my my programs and break some of those, you know, fundamental rules yeah. that you would you wouldn't normally break because it's like, oh, okay, well yeah, th yes, I know the squat or the deadlift or the head press is such a great movement, but I've got X, Y, and Z yeah, going on with this function. I need to address. Yeah, yeah. And so that's when I think I started to prioritize that, that, totally. that way of thinking. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Powerlift. I'm going to give that away for free, but you got to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. You'll get free access to MAPS Powerlift. Also, the big sale we're running right now ends on the 14th, so you still have time. So check this out. We've taken a bunch of different MAPS programs, put them in a bunch of small bundles, two and three program bundles. Every single one of them is $99.99. $99.99 cents for every single bundle that you find at mapsaugust.com. So go check it out. Here comes the show. You guys want to hear something crazy? Hmm. Yes. Uh, did you guys know... So I just read this this morning. So you guys know how the earth spins, right? Yes. You guys knew that? Yes. Already? Okay. In a flat way, like a, like a, yeah. Yeah, like a pizza it's, box. It's, like, is yeah. that the, okay? I never actually thought about that. What is the theory for flat earthers on, is it, is it spinning, but they think it's spinning this way? Or do they not even think it's like spinning? I feel like they think it's like a dome or something. And then the bottom half That's is all question. ice. I, I think they think it's, it's flat. And the, I think they think the sun still goes over the, around the earth. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. I don't know. If we we don't have anybody so crazy hovering? enough. We're not to spinning. I don't. We're on the back. Of a, we're, we're on the back of a giant turtle. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I thought for sure you, you guys, conspiracy guys, would know for sure. Like, bro, we're I've not heard, I've heard wacky things. Listen, man. I like conspiracy theories yeah. that I can at least like entertain. That are like <laughs> really just like government driven. I don't know. I like. I, I'm just like. I'm always skeptical of people in powerful positions. That's where I'm like, okay, conspiracies. Well, the flat earthers that. believe that they think it's all a government conspiracy. They think right? that yeah, the earth, that's like they think the earth beyond they, science and everything. Do you know, I, I think you know? they think it's surrounded Doug, back by. Back when you were a flat earther, do you remember what they used to say in the media? Hey, hey, back, back, back when that was accepted, earther. you know, before Galileo, Doug, when, you were, when you were only 12. NASA's a hoax. I just, know? I never thought about that. Until I think you they just... think that the earth is surrounded, like around the edges is an ice wall. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, it's, it's like a it's, huge it's ice It's like wall. Game of Thrones, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that what a plane does is they trick us by, See? it flies one way and it comes back. So that they, <laughs> I, I wonder, I wonder if there's a correlation. So all like, the airplanes uh, are in on it too? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so I don't know, Doug, do you, do you know what they say? That the, that how the how they explain the sun and the moon? I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, like I don't have answers. For shows you. up from one side Sorry to for the, the other. Distraction there. You just yes. I mean to think about that. You know what? I've never well, thought about what they. Well, check this. I didn't realize this. So uh, the Earth is spinning faster and faster. Apparently, so uh, June 29th was the fastest day in recorded history, uh, clocking in at doesn't sound like much, but still kind of interesting. One and a half seconds shorter than the average 24 hours that we know and love. So according to a recent study, the earth started to spin faster back in 2016. I'm telling you, Justin. What do they speculate? I'm What's telling you, the, we're in another freaking is our days parallel shorter? universe. Yeah, that means the days are shorter. Well, first off, it's a day is not- Hadron Collider or whatever. It feels the, like it, right? Right? That, I know. It's just shaking everything up. Now, the 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 earth, it, the, a day is not a perfect 24 hours. I've known that for a while. It's like 23 hours and something. It's not perfect 24, but apparently 
it's spinning faster. And there's a number of factors that contribute to this. It's magma core, ocean tides uh, can impact how fast the earth spins. Hmm. Um, and in the past, it's actually spun slower at other times and other times it's spun faster. Now, hasn't the uh, axis also changed uh, a bit over time? Like, yeah. yeah. And so it's like it tilts a bit. So then, um, you know, the seasons obviously and where the sun hits has, has changed. Do you know the speed at what we're moving? That the earth is moving? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't know what that number is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, wow? Why would I know that? <laughs> I know. So that's some random shit. Yeah. You know what's really weird? I remember as a kid, uh, I must have been in fourth grade or fifth grade. You know, every model of the solar system is like the sun and then the, you know, the, you know Venus and then all these different planets spinning around. And I literally thought that we're just spinning around the earth in this one stationary place. And I remember I was in fourth grade. In science class, this teacher was like, how do you guys think that the, the the planets travel through the universe? And so everybody drew the solar system. He goes, no, everything's moving yeah, through the universe. So the sun is going way. and we're following yeah. the sun. So it's like the earth is not in the same place it was ever. No. Ever. Yeah. Everything's just, we're just flying through this expanding universe. Yeah. Never well, if you think place. Big Bang, everything exploded out. So we're just moving out and expanding further beyond into the abyss. Yeah. That's when they turned on the uh, the simulation. That's my theory. That's when? Yeah. They deep boom. They plugged it in. A, the game is a on. button hits. <laughs> yeah. Here we go, guys. Okay. They, well, I got something else that's a, a little bit different, but um, you guys know the old uh, kind of stereotype of, of Southerners being kind of slow and um. Yeah, it, anyway, there's just sort of dumb, slow kind of like in uh, movies. Yeah, in movies yeah. they always depict them because yeah. accent and Got it. whatever, sure. right? Uh, you know where that comes from? No. Okay. So I didn't know this either. Uh, Wait a minute. Hold on. I think my son showed me a video once, and I'm probably not where you're going, but it was an English accent that eventually turned. Oh, uh, okay. I'm not talking about the accent okay. or anything. There's right. actually like something else that was interesting to me. Uh, I don't know if this was like early 1900s when exactly, but it was Rockefeller time where he yeah. uh, kind of was still still around. Um, they but, ship books down there. Yeah. No. So basically they had a really big problem. And I, I learned this from um, Whitney Cummings actually brought this up on Joe Rogan's podcast and I was tripping out. They had a um, hookworm problem and it was this parasite that uh, if you'd walk outside barefoot, um, you know, would would make its way in your body all the way up to the brain. There's some like neurotoxin in it where oh, it would affect your brain to where it actually like would make you like, you know, your speech and everything would be affected and like you sounded like s slow. And um, so this was like it pervaded. It was like 40 percent of the population in the South like had this. Wow. Um, this parasite. And so uh, Rockefeller actually put a ton of money into it like a million i think back then to today's probably like a billion um in into the to solving this problem and so it it helped a lot but i guess there's still some hookworm uh parasites there that they they deal with that's but. wild did you know that they're researching parasites for to solve chronic uh, autoimmune issues huh? do you guys know that to go in and eat like bad bacteria what no they, no no what, no what no what they do no so there's this really strange theory. First off, it actually works. So you take someone who has Crohn's disease, right? Or severe allergies and you give them a parasite. And oftentimes the allergies go way down. And sometimes they go into like no symptoms, like full remission. Is this and, that, that, that lining of the gut where it like, it brings back that uh, relationship between parasite and the uh, bacteria? They don't, they, they don't quite know what's going on. In fact, there are treatment centers in, in South America. And I believe in Mexico, they won't do it here yet where people who have like terrible Crohn's disease, for example, and I use that as an example because I have a family member with Crohn's, and they'll go to this place and they'll they'll infect them purposefully with parasites, and then their symptoms will get much better. Mm. And the theory is that the our bodies evolved constantly fighting off parasites and bacteria and all this other stuff. It's the, it's the what is it, the, the clean Sounds theory, right? Sketchy. What's that theory called? The the spotless clean theory or something like that, right? Where the reason why we have all these autoimmune issues is we've made everything so damn clean that our immune systems have become hypervigilant uh, yeah. because they're not exposed to anything. So they start attacking our, it starts attacking us. Hmm. This is why kids who grow up on farms or kids who grow up with animals, I don't know if you guys knew this, if you have pets, your kid's odds of having allergies and 
um, autoimmune issues goes down yeah. mm-hmm. because of it. Because they're exposed to so it. So they're actually researching. I read a book on this a long time ago, researching infecting, like wh- what what's going on. And some people are actually doing this as treatment. They're going to they go purposely get parasites to solve their chronic <laughs> yeah, health it's issues. Crazy. Like, please, you know, enter my body. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know if I'm that is comfortable the, I'd be with that. That yeah. is the that is the wildest thing. Yeah. Uh, also, um, this is kind of crazy news. Uh, there was this this teacher in Texas. I feel like this never happened when we were kids or we never heard about it. I don't know. Uh, but there's this teacher in Texas who's going to jail because she had, female, she had sex with her sixth grade student. I Do you guys ever remember as wow. kids, female teachers no. doing shit with kids? Uh, I mean, like. Justin's like, well, I do have a I know a, story. a guy. <laughs> <laughs> do you really? Yeah, I know yeah. a guy. Yeah, you oh, that's right. You have told me you know a guy who actually slept with his teacher. Yeah. Huh? What? How old? Yeah, he was in like sixth grade, but he was like, what? he had a beard and everything already. In he was, sixth grade? He was very mature. In sixth grade? He was he was in my brother's class, So, um, but I had heard through the grapevine, whatever, that um, he had he had slept with his teacher, and then it like came out to be true, and then this teacher got fired, and then- you Oh, know, my God. Yeah. I did not. I see. I, I don't remember ever hearing stuff like this. But there's like these female teachers that are having sex with. It wasn't young talked male about students. because that's the thing is like if you're if you're a, a boy and this happens like yeah it's they don't going to keep it same. under wraps. Yeah, it's you not know? a bad thing. Yeah, too. it's, it's like, not really a bad thing. You, you do a little fist boy. bump to your to your friend. You yeah. Know, well, like, sixth grade though is young. That's well, no, really. Young. I mean, the reality yeah. is it's a terrible thing. You know, of I course. have kids. If I had a sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grader, you know, who boy and yeah, well, teacher it's, it's did that. Predatory for yeah, sure. Very predatory. Yeah. Now, okay, do you do you still know him? Like do you guys still have you talked to him? Uh you know he, oh, this guy was yeah, he's he's crazy. We called him Karate Chris. So, mm. he, so now everybody he, knows. Who I mean, is he, everybody is, knows who is he, he is. fucked yeah. up from it or is he I mean <laughs> is it he was never he was never right. So, to begin so with. Yeah, he's yeah, he's he was always out there. But um, no, he's I mean he's a nice guy and everything. Because I've told you guys I had a buddy who but we were sixteen. We were sixteen. Okay, so was, you're getting a little older. Yeah, he was sixteen and he was he was sleeping with the boss's wife at who was thirty at the time. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It and was you, like a like a like a you know, he was braggadocious thing about it. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. he was like it was not like a she was taking advantage was of him. Same, yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, she got to the point where she was, like, writing him, like, love letters and stuff like oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it got really you imagine your wife, your 30-year-old wife, and you yeah. find out, oh, you're cheating on me. So now you're like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Yeah. And, like, who is it? It's like a, a young kid. Oh, yeah, like they're, like they're just devastated. <laughs> yeah, bro, that'd be super. What the hell is going super on? embarrassing? Bro. Embarrassing you're, and disgusting. Cheating on you with a teenager. Oh. <laughs> what the? F- I mean, I, that's gotta like. Where did you go wrong? Yeah, man. dude. There's this, this the stereotype, right? Is uh, and I know it's based on actual data. It's usually it's more often men that are doing these types of things. So when I hear it's a female, an older, you know, a, a female teacher. It just feels so like scary. I feel like did, it's less. Yeah, it's it's more rare. How did we yeah. How did we come up with the age eighteen as uh, the for, like formal age for being adult? Like like when did that When did it evolve? It's into not. That? It's not like that in every country. I know it's not. That's yeah. why I'm asking. That. I have like, no like, idea. When did when 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 was it like that? Do you know? I have no idea. Do you know that, Doug? At all? I don't. I think there's laws too in different states, even still, that are different. You know, in terms of like the acceptable like age, age of consent. First consent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know some are more strict than others. I know that. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know how much younger other it countries. Get, you know? Oh, again, in Europe, there's some. In Europe, it's some countries like 16, 15, age of consent. But I know that they also have laws with the age gap. So, like, if you're 15 with a 17 year old or 18 year old, but if you're 15 with like a 30 or 40 year old, I think oh. that they have laws like that. Which say no, that's not. This cool. reminds me, like, so I guess, like, um, Dane Cook is is engaged or whatever, and like he's getting grief because there's like a 27 year gap, I think, between his fiance and him. He's like 50, she's like 20. Dane Cook's 50 something now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but it's like, feel? I yeah. mean. Did you? Did she's you see, 23. Like, well, once you get to a certain point, age, yeah. although that's still kind of weird. It's, I mean, but, there's a big gap. Not, for, hey, a, not it, for a celebrity guy no, who's like on true. plastic you, surgery bro, and money. And, bro, that's nothing. Go back in time to like rock old like rock and roll stars like uh, Elvis Presley. Oh, Elvis or, Presley. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, did you Great see Woody fire. Allen too? No, oh, yeah. What's uh, his name? Yes. Uh, Doug, who sings that? Great Balls of Fire. What's his name? 
Uh, Jerry Lee Jerry Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, Thank it was his, you. It was, wasn't it his cousin or something like that? Oh, was yeah, sixteen year old or something right. like that, or fifteen year old. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh wow. And that was back. That was did back you see? Then. Did you know? Do you know Dane Cook when he kind of like fell off the? He like fell off. Like he was on movies. He was all over the place. Yeah. And then like we kind of didn't hear from him for yeah. a while. You know what had happened? Like his no. his brother. Yeah, his brother. Mm-hmm. His brother was st- yeah money. stealing money from him, dude, like fifteen million dollars. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, him right there. Ugh. Look how look how much plastic surgery he's had, dude. Yeah, he doesn't look that great. Is that her? That's his. That's his wife. Yeah, that's his. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're engaged. How old is she? She's. I think she's twenty three. Okay, so you know what's funny about this is that you know a lot of people are going to say this. They're going to be like, oh, he's just with her because she's young and hot. I'm like, well, yeah, but she's well, just with him because he's got money. You know. Yeah, you know, fame and mon- money. So they, it's a trade right there. Yeah. Interesting. Whatever. I mean, yeah. I, I think once you're an adult, uh, sure, it is still kind of whatever, kind of strange. But in Hollywood, that's not that's that's par no. for the course. I, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's such a remember win. Catherine Zeta. I feel Jones like it's a win for both cases. They're I know. Pro- I don't. They're probably not going to be married that, that long. She's going to have a nice case. She's going to have a nice little purse that she's going to get after that. You know what I'm saying? And he gets to be with like a young hot chick. Like, Do you guys remember? Uh, remember that like- the Playboy model Anna Nicole Smith. And didn't yeah. she marry some like 87 year old like, Tech, like yeah, Texas billionaire yeah, yeah oil <laughs> guy who was this, he just looks like a corpse isn't, isn't that what <laughs> isn't that when like the whole gold digger thing became a thing that's I thought that's when it got popular do you remember people saying gold digger when you were in like junior high or something I don't Wasn't remember there that. A rap I think there was a rap song that said that right well yeah that's Kanye West that but that's, later. that's later though yeah. I mean, oh I guess you're right yeah Anna Nicole Smith that story bro, was that old. picture pull that I, up pull I the wonder Anna Nicole if it came out from that I think that I think it did come from that bro huh. it, I don't it, remember hearing gold digger before that it's the funniest thing ever you see the picture and he does look like a corpse, bro. <laughs> Did you ever see a make out, dude? I, no, oh, I don't want to see that, dude. I made that mistake. That's dude. So I watched disgusting. the video and I was like, I feel like ah. she earned she earned some of that, buddy. Didn't <laughs> she, she get sued did. though when he died from the family? Oh yeah, because he basically left everything to her, you know. And they wow. were like, they were so mad about that, you know. I mean, I get it. Like, of course, <laughs> if, 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 when of your course they're gonna be mad. Like, come on, dad. Like, he's like, I'm gonna go out with how, a bang. Oct- how often does look like, at that picture, dude? Oh, wow. oh, that's terrible, bro. Dude, and Nicole 89. Smith he was, was 89 was hot years old back in the day. Oh yeah. God, you imagine that your 89 year old dad? It's like, hey, I got this. New there's girlfriend. You, if you're if you're Anna Nicole, there's no I mean, way bravo. you can spin that. Like, what can you see other than like what exactly what you're doing? Yeah, like, She's, this is just natural organic love. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 But what's he doing too? Yeah. Same shit for How him. How did you meet? Well, yeah. I mean, he, of he's of course, dude. I used to train. I used to train this this eighty. He was like eighty seven year old man. Now people, everybody first calm down when I tell the story. That generation is <laughs> yeah, very you different. Started, started, calm down because right. yes, calm down because that generation. You got to understand that generations are different, and we can't judge past generations on current standards. Okay. Yeah. So you got to give a little bit of grace with some of the stuff. Not a, not tons, but some. Right. So this eighty seven year old man will come in, and he was like, you know, deconditioned. Like he looked like an eighty seven year old man, and we'd work out, and he would just like if a like my one of my female trainers or something he'd like tap on me eh, eh, you know it's shit like that <laughs> eh, 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 or yeah that'll give me a pump you know he'd make comments like that oh and god and i'd shake my I head had, and i had a client like i that. would shake my head and i ignore him and i yeah. just keep training right and then he'd get worse with it one at one point i had a ton i said listen you can't like yeah, yeah. like that's they yeah. can hear you bro but like, listen that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, got, you can't say that those dude. thoughts need to remain here <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bro. <laughs> You got to keep that. To I yourself. think you get to a certain age, and uh, you, you just know, don't give a yeah, shit. Yeah, Doug's approaching this before us, when he'll be like, "You just zero <laughs> fucks, right? Yeah. You just say what you want, you do and, what you and want, and you get a pass." You yeah, know? like, Dude. like they'll be, oh, oh, my yeah. Gra- yeah, my, like, my grandfather hasn't given a fuck for so long. Not with that, but just other stuff like, <laughs> like the first time he met Jessica, you know, like, yeah. oh, it's my grandfather, whatever. Oh, nice to meet you. We're talking. <laughs> he just farts. Hell loud, boosh, just blast just right away. <laughs> yeah. First time meeting. And he laughs. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, he doesn't care. That's like my uncle, my uncle Casey, wow. dude. My uncle Casey is like the type of person where I have to, I always have to like, like tell, sit someone down, like, listen, and this is my uncle and he doesn't mean any of this. He's this, uh, but just be ready. And they're always like, oh yeah, totally fine. And then you just, he'll sit, say some shit. Oh, yeah, just like, we weren't wall, ready. Sh- you know? wall, shit. Anyway, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a, a left turn here. Uh, I, I just learned something really interesting about uh, kids and blue light. So you know how blue light exposure at night can affect melatonin production and, mm-hmm. and mess with your sleep? It's actually way worse for kids than it is for adults. So children, when, they're, when they get uh, really? exposed to blue light before going to bed, 
Now is that just they have a stronger influence on their melatonin than adults even do? Now is that just because kids need more rest than you do as you get older? It's both. Okay, it's that plus they seem to have a and I'll pull it up. Uh, it was uh, Rhonda, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. You guys remember her, right? Yeah, what, she's falling off, huh? Yeah, she's the one that like. Well, uh, is it fair for me to say that? I just haven't seen her. I haven't seen like she when she first did. Check. Joe it. Rogan, she exploded. Yeah, kind of huge. Didn't hear I love her. I love her yeah, stuff. She's, she's got a great she's, Instagram. But check. she's brilliant, but really hard to listen to. Oh, I enjoy well, it. Very oh thick Dude, really? in the science. Oh yeah, I have a good very time. Thick in the science, I, I love yeah. listening to her. Oh, so hard. so check this out. Children who got less than nine hours of sleep at night had uh, their brain volume shrink, and the the smaller brain volume lasted for two what years. Does that mean your brain volume shrink? The total size of your brain. Their brains actually got affected. By having worse sleep to the point where the brains wow, actually shrink. Started to compress. Yeah. So less than nine hours of sleep per night was connected to mental health issues uh, with children. So blue well, light alarming. before bed, uh, you know, big impact on kids. So, I mean, I got those, uh, I got the blue light, the Felix Gray blue light blocking glasses for my older yeah. kids because they'll be on their, you know, computers and stuff. And um, sometimes I got to get on them because they'll forget. But I can, I mean, I know. I, I wonder how much. I got to go back and get some new ones because, you know, some of those kids ones are like really small. Mm -hmm. Like at first it, it fit, but uh, now they're like, <laughs> I and Everett started wearing them again, but like they're like little spectacles now. Yeah, you know? so I'm bigger like, now. Yeah, I got to get them a bigger pair. Do you think that, you think that market will ever really penetrate kids? Do you think it'll actually, that sounds really bad. Well, yeah, so, sorry. Mm, between yeah, Sal's think, info earlier <laughs> yeah, than bringing that up. Sorry. You could have just kept going. going well well as it rolled, it as it rolled off, it just it felt bad. Jerry Lee Lewis did it again. Uh, I, the market, the market, does it, do you, do you think that it will? Do you think that that's, cause I feel like, you, it's like a health wellness care thing, and you already—that's already a losing battle for most adults trying to get kids to do that. I mean, what I is your health conscious parents? But how many parents are like that? Health. Well, you guys are. So, it, what is your? Are you like really successful with it? Like, do the kids adopt it? Like I have to cool? be. I have to be on it. Um, I have to be on top of it. Yeah, I. You know, I backed and, off on it a bit, and then now it's like they. They look at it as like, hey, dad, look what I'm doing. Like, cause, <laughs> so, because I keep so I taking play, right? away the iPad. Yeah, I keep taking it away so they don't have access to it. And so they're trying like every angle to try and be like, hey, dad, well, I'm going to be, with the, you know, I'll make sure I'm wearing my blue blocking glasses. And, um, uh, you know, I'm doing something creative on here. Look, I'm, I'm doing being creative. And I'm, so they're, they're trying every sales point to just make sure that they have access. That to was it. my kids when they were younger. They yeah. would come to me and my daughter would be like, Hey, there's this really cool like video teaches you how to like edit videos and do that. I'm like, mm -hmm. I just want to go watch YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I have to be on them. I have to be on top of them uh, when they do it. But I mean, it has a strong impact on children. So if it's more important for you to have your kids avoid blue light an hour or two before bed, or at the very least wear blue light blocking glasses. Yeah. You know? We should be due for our, our, our quarterly report from them, no? Have we got that? Have you seen from that? Felix Gray? Yeah. Have you seen that come across yet? I haven't seen it. We just started getting a, a bunch of them come, coming across. You see, uh, I saw Magic Spoon and they're uh, in Target. You see them? They're there? in Target? Oh, they're making yeah. moves right now. I saw that and I saw them with a bunch of, I think they just sponsored or partnered up with a bunch of athletes and famous mm -hmm. people like- yeah, it's making. I you wish know, you know, I had that when I was younger. I oh, yeah. wish I had what is protein it, cereal. Are you kidding me? What is it per box know. for when you go through our our link and so that? Because I and Target it's eight ninety nine for a box. Yeah, we get five dollars off with our link if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you save basically shipping with us. Yeah. Um, Let's find. I'll have to yeah. find it. Uh, is there yeah, a new flavor that you said you like? Oh, what I love, I was going to say, what I love about them is they're always like um, updating a lot of the formulas uh, with some of the their hits. Like for for instance, the the fruity or the, even the blueberry, they just uh, redid the the recipe for it. So it's like it's blueberry muffin now. It's, it has a little. I bit saw that. I asked flavor. Jerry that if it was. I couldn't remember if it was always blueberry muffin. I didn't notice. No, they, or they changed, changed it a little no. bit. Yeah. Oh, oh I wonder if it it's tastes good. Different. I like it. Yeah. yeah well, it's five dollars off, by the way. Okay. Oh, so what's, what's well, the that's price our code, there? but what's the price per box? Well, it's ten. I think ten dollars a box, and then you get the five dollar discount. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. It, so carry the five. No. <laughs> so it's cheaper need, at Target. Like, math just go no, above, uh, above his head, right I'll, there. I'll look at the real retail. Well, there's price only four here. boxes in there. That would be it. Would be a uh, it would be cheaper or the same price? That can't be right. Mm. Come on, Douglas. Mm. It's eight ninety nine at Target. I just saw 3. it for one box. Nine. Yeah, for one box. Yeah, yeah. What's up with the thumbs up? So, Andrew, Andrew's got it. Dueling computers. Let's see who gets there first. Yeah. 
Oh, eight, so eight seventy five. So it's a little bit. Oh, so you save a whole quarter. Wow, look at that. Well, not only do you save money, <laughs> it ships to your house. That's right. Not only do you save your money, it comes to your house. Yeah. And, and the gas that you have to drive. And to every to box of Magic Spoon purchased through our link uh, has been uh, gives diapers to your children. By yeah. Justin, oh, Justen <laughs> put his hand in the box and swirled it around. Help, helps <laughs> pay for the diapers for your <laughs> no, for your children. Kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so every bite is got okay, Justin. Well, I mean, I as just, long as it's I cheaper, I, I just whenever our partners do something that. I get so frustrated when I see something where they're offering it for a better deal. That's because one of the things that, and I don't know if the audience knows this, but one of the things that uh, I did early on when we negotiated a lot of these deals was we would give up, you know, commission or we would give up. So we have the best price. So we have the best price. I, I would I would take less money from these companies because I wanted like listen. I what I don't want to happen is we promote a brand and then they tell me oh I get it way cheaper at all these other places. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I always get frustrated when I see something like that where I see a sale. If that, it's cheaper than what we sell it for, it's probably uh, it's probably expired. So you probably won't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flash sale. Dude, I don't, I don't, know dude, about don't get sued by like Target. I don't know. Mold bro. toxicity is really bad. <laughs> It's you know cool I mean? though to see. I mean, it's. I mean, how cool is that? Like we, it's been a few years now yeah. that we've been working with them, but to see them in a place like Target is yep. is pretty awesome to see. I saw. Uh, yep. I got a, a, so one of my clients sent me over a photo of Pathwater in in Nordstrom's now too. Like Pathwater's going everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, I know. When we went to the airport, you know, they they uh, San Francisco airport has is completely eliminated. It's all uh, um, aluminum. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. No more plastic, no more plastic bottles plastic at all. Yep. You made a call that I'm so we should put it on the show because I don't think you've said it on the show as your prediction is that the, you think that they're going to make it California probably being one of the first states to do it, make it like like outlaw plastic. Yeah, at some point, legislation is going to come forward and ban uh, single use plastic bottles. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Just because they they don't recycle well, they are not great for the environment, and you get plastic bits in your water. And I mean, like I could list yeah a ton of reasons. Um, and aluminum is very recyclable, very reusable. Plastics are everywhere, everywhere. So I, that's what I think. I think the legislation. Is gonna is what's gonna make uh, companies like Pathwater just explode. Now, how, how do you feel about that? Because you have to be partially torn. Because it, it, you you own. I love it. You own I'm part invested of, in. Yeah, Pathwater. you're invested in Pathwater, so that's <laughs> a good thing for you. But how do you feel like about? I I have to look. Okay, when it comes to that kind of stuff, I have to look at the numbers and say, does it actually make sense? Because sometimes it makes sense on one point, but when you look at the whole picture, it doesn't. For example, banning plastic bags in favor of paper bags. But if you actually do the math of production and transporting everything, it actually doesn't, mm. it's actually doesn't save anything. So in this case, from what I've seen, it makes a big difference. Plastic bottles are a big problem yeah. and aluminum is extremely recyclable. You recycle an aluminum can and it, a lot of people don't know this, by the way, you recycle your cardboard, your plastic, it's not getting recycled. Yeah. It is not getting recycled. Yeah, we have more than we can recycle. No, no, they, they throw it away. Yeah. They well, literally, it away. You, we separate it, they combine it together and they dump it. This, well, it still gets recycled because it's it's worth recycling is aluminum. Yeah. And I think glass, if I'm not mistaken, but I know aluminum is. Aluminum is like one aluminum bottle or can, like the vast majority of that gets reused and turned into another one. So it's very recyclable, whereas plastic bottles and cardboard boxes and shit like that is, it costs more to recycle it than it is to throw it away, which makes it inefficient, which means nobody wants to recycle it. So, I thought I read somewhere that it was that we just we get so much of it that we can't possibly recycle all of it. I didn't think it was that. We it was. would if it were if it were efficient and valuable. We used to sell it to China. We used to sell all of our cardboard and shit to China. They stopped buying it. So like a lot of places. In fact, you'll actually find this with some garbage cans. Have you guys seen those public garbage cans? And on the top is like uh, organic waste and plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. And then you look in the garbage, and it's the same bag. Have you guys seen those? Mm -hmm. You find them all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's one hole for this, one hole for this. It goes it in the same bag. It just goes and funnels it right in. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, this is just making know, people feel it, better. It did, yeah. This is bullshit. It tainted so my whole funny, thoughts around it. Oh, yeah, dude. Super virtual. Yeah. Oh, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. It's really just dude. aluminum cans. Uh, but aluminum is very recyclable, so that's that's a worthwhile one. Anyway, I think uh, we can get on the phone, right? With, yeah, yeah, we got Joe right Joe. now. Yeah, we have Joe's, Joe's, talk about the Joe's call right now. Do the, talk about the sport. I'm excited, dude. It's, uh, what, end of next month, I think is when it is? September 24th to 26th. Coming up. And uh, we've hooked something up to where if you use our code, we get nothing. So we did this for free, but 100% of the proceeds go to uh, a, a a cause that we firmly believe in, which is what he's going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Okay. So here's the deal. I know you came to us uh, a, a month or two ago about trying to do some sort of deal where we 
pick a race, we promote it, we do some sort of a kickback for you know our audience going there, we host an event there. The guys and I, we talked, we just decided that it, one, it's just going to be way too much to, to try and blend away for we make money and a split on it. The fact that you're going to be donating a, a big bulk of this money to a good cause that we we believe in, we could all get behind, we'd rather just do you a solid and just because we have a lot of people in our audience that already love Spartan Race. So I think just uh, us promoting the race and sending your way and uh, we don't need anything in return. So I think just share with us a little bit about Jimmy and his foundation, because this is what I think we all agreed sounds the most interesting to us. Yeah, no, I love it. So Jimmy um, was the head of the World Boxing Association. Um, he's in his 80s. He was um, one of the only lawyers in the country admitted in 20 plus states. He basically took 20 plus bar exams. He was Don King's attorney against Mike Tyson. He was in two Rocky movies. Um, complete badass. And um, it's a funny story. Uh, like a lot of my mentors, I would say he's an elder for me. Um, they call me early in the morning. I'm, you know, I'm a guy that wakes up early and there's not a lot of people that call at five or six in the morning. So I got like four or five guys like Jimmy that call me early in the morning and, um, and they just want to shoot the shit. And I don't know, three, four or five years ago, Jimmy hits me up and says, oh, I can't take it anymore. I said, what's up? He said, uh, this neighbor I have out here in Margate, Margate's like the Hamptons of uh, the Atlantic City area. You know, it's a beach community. This neighbor, uh, they got an air conditioner, the thing rattles, I can't get any sleep. I said, well, go ring the bell, talk, you know, talk to them. I'm sure they'll accommodate you and fix the, ah, fuck them, I fucking work on blah, 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 and they're not listening. About three, four weeks go by, Jimmy calls me and he says, I took care of it. I said, how'd you take care of it? He said, I hired a plumber. We took everything apart and I put it on their front porch. I said, you can't, <laughs> <laughs> you can't take somebody's air conditioning unit apart and put it on their front porch without, you know, talking to them. And he said, well, I did. <laughs> anyway, the police show up and they arrest him. And it turns out that he was actually okay disconnecting everything because it turned out it was on his property. He got, wow. so, he got so furious. Now he's in his 70s, okay? He got so furious that the police had the audacity to arrest him over this because he's an upstanding citizen, a lawyer for all these years, that he said, I'm going to become a police officer. And he went and he applied and he went through the fitness test and everything and he became a police officer. What? Yeah. So he is now, not only is he an attorney, not only does he do all the things he's been doing for 50 plus years, he's now a cop and he teaches, um, he teaches how to ride, you know, a, a Harley, right? He's gotten tons of Harley Davidsons donated. He, he teaches all these uh, police officers and he, um, he's full blown cop. So when I look back, it actually fits, it, it fits him because years ago, I don't know, 15, 15 years ago, he decided, he felt really bad for any cop that was killed on duty, like we all would feel bad. But he went one step further and he found the actual location where that officer was killed in the, in the line of, you know, while, while working. And he had a plaque donated at each one of these locations. He went back to the 1920s. Whoa. And so he's given way, I don't know how many plaques, three, 400 plaques he's donated um, to officers who died in the line of duty and brings the family, in some cases, the grandkids, the great grandkids out and honors them. So, um, so he's got this charity um, that supports, plus, plus he's taken a bunch of those kids and grandkids then and supported them and given them scholarships. So, um, so I think it's an awesome charity. I think what he does is amazing. By the way, he's the guy, if you know anything about Philadelphia, you know the Rocky Stairs where Sylvester Stallone runs up in the movie. He was the one that put the statue there, the Sylvester Stallone statue um, at the base of the stairs. The mayor of Philly uh, gave him his own parking spot in the city. They gave, yeah, he's, he's, pretty, um, he's pretty unbelievable character and he does a lot of good. That's awesome. That's, be, a, that's a great. That's a great cause. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of uh, driving people to to your race and uh, and 
to raise some money for that. Yeah, so let's talk about the race a little bit, Joe. Tell me, tell me the the race dates. It's the Tahoe. What all events are are being held there? Uh, and then uh, even I, even down to the ticket price and stuff. Do you even know your own stuff like that? Do you know your ticket price and all this stuff? I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to Google right now. No, <laughs> Tahoe, um, Spartan uh, date. Hang on a second. While you're doing that, uh, can you multitask and tell me what the the thought of like how will the donation work? Is it going to be like a, a a portion of the enrollment for the race? Like how how will you do it? No, what we'll do is we'll give you um, a code, Mind Pump. Okay. And all the people that sign up with that code, we'll just take a hundred percent of the funds, which is like a hundred, a hundred and twenty dollars a ticket. We'll take 100% of the funds and we'll give it to, to Jimmy's charity so he could support more more kids of the fallen officers and more of these plaques to be wow. donated. 100%. Um, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So so I hate to say it. It's all in your hands now. Um, <laughs> um, but it's it. listen, it's um, on September 24th. So we got a short fuse. September 24th to 26th. Okay. Um, is the event. So let's get as many people there as we can under the mind pump moniker. And, um, you guys uh, should come out anyway and, um, and we should have some fun, torture some people. Yeah. I think that, uh, I don't know if all of us, I think Justin is going to be gone somewhere, but I think Doug, me, Sal, will probably be up there with our family. So we'll, we'll come up and visit and say hi and hang out, make sure we link up. You'll obviously be there, right? I'll be there. It's going to be amazing. We'll have some fun. Now this one um, is uh is the, this is the big one, right? This is the big championship, right? Yeah, this is a, this is an ultra championship. So you know, we have different distance events. I I've, I've been racing and doing competing in events myself since the mid 90s. And what I found was number one by signing up for events it kept me in shape because it forces you to hold yourself accountable. Uh, number two, I found that coming out of January, February that you know that hibernation period we all go through um, especially when you live in a place with seasons, uh, I would I would probably want to do some shorter distance events, and then by September October I was ready for the big ones. So this is a big one, um, and big for us means it's two loops of a beast. The beast is 13 miles, so two loops of marathon oh. up and down that mountain in Lake Tahoe. So you know you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of demons in your own head. You're gonna work some things out. You're gonna really get to meet yourself in an event like that. But we also just have a beast, which is a single loop. Every human being on the planet should at least do this once in their life because, um, because like I said, you know, you've got to re we all have to reconcile issues in our brain. I've got a buddy. I'm, I'm out in Long Island right now. I've got a buddy that I got into this stuff back in the late 90s. And every year <clears throat> he'll, he'll connect with me with some old, old time friends where we used to race a lot together. And, and we'll just train for three days. So yesterday he showed up and we ran uh, 20. Today he made me run 25 this morning. And, um, and I'm getting old. And tomorrow we got to run 20 again. And I'll tell you, today I saw some demons. Um, I, I was reconciling some shit in my head. And, and you get to a place, you know, doing these things where you just want water, food, and shelter. You know, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when you get to that place where you just want water, food, and shelter, literally, like if I just had water, God, if I just had water, I would fix this in my life. I promise I would like, just get me water. And, um, and you work those things out in your head and everything else kind of melts away. The other interesting thing when you do hard things like this, yesterday at like mile 17, I stopped and I was able to buy some grapes, just grapes. This woman was selling grapes on the side of the road. And they were the best grapes I've ever had in my entire 53 years on the planet. And I said, oh, my God, these grapes, they're just regular grapes. They were probably rotten, but I was so fucking hungry that um, it makes it makes a great. So you start to appreciate everything in your life when you're at a place where you just want to quit, you know? Yeah, one of the, speaking to that, one of the things that we talk about on the show a lot is that the 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 rise of interest in races like this, and we speculate that a lot of that has to do with our our lives have become so cush and easy, and we sit at these desks all day long. What are you seeing? I mean, I know we're just coming out of COVID, so it is kind of a weird time. Or 
Are 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 you seeing a, a, a spike in enrollment? Is it st- what happened with with COVID and then now coming out of it? Like, are we are you starting to climb again? What's been like for you guys? Yeah, so it's it was obviously really hard. Right. We, we got shut down in forty five countries. Uh, the year I got shut down in Mar- March thirteenth, I had already sold three hundred and fifty thousand entries um, that I couldn't deliver on. Um, right, I collected thirty five million dollars from people. And I couldn't, I couldn't host those races. So they, those people, as you can imagine, did everything short of showing up with, you know, tar and feathers at my farm in Vermont, wanting to kill me. And, um, and I had to furlough a bunch of people. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. What people don't realize is if you're in the event business, you don't pay your bills the day of the event. You don't pay for the venue the day of the event. You don't pay for insurance the day of the event. You don't pay employees the day of the event. All of that stuff you've been paying for the last seven or eight months. So that $35 million in that example is already spent. Wow. And, and, then, you, and then you put on the event and you're, and you're setting up for the next event. So there was no way to refund, refund people. So I had to promise them future races, which is scary for them because they're like, we don't know if there are going to be future races. For all we know, this COVID thing, you know, we're going to be shut down for 10 years. Spartan may go out of business, et cetera. But, but we, we stood up. And we fought through and somehow we came out the other side and put on a bunch of races where we satisfied those IOUs. But imagine them putting on those 20, 30 events and not getting paid for them because yeah. they had already paid two years earlier. Right? So then that's a massive disaster financially. But anyway, we, we finally dug out of all that. And um, 20, in 2022 this year, We'll have about 1.15 million registrations. It should be 1.5 million registrations. So I'm about that exact number short, about 350,000 registrations short of goal for this year. Um, and I attribute that to the fact that Canada stayed closed. Canada is still kind of closed. The UK has opened and closed and opened and closed and drove, driven the entire society crazy. California, as you, you guys know, it was just really late to open and get back in the game. I, I, I came, I don't know, three or four months ago, I was at a hotel in California. I was trying to go into the gym and they gave me a time slot because there was only one person in the gym allowed every half hour or something. So California just was slow. Super rational over here. It's the most rational state in the country, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that was annoying. But places like Florida and Tech, you know, places that were open, they were on fire, right? They never really shut down. Um, so I would say 2023 is setting up to be, you know, our best year ever. Nice. Um, going through this really impossible challenge for us these last two and a half years has just made us stronger and better. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's where we are. Can I ask you a couple personal business questions? Sure. Um, did you consider filing bankruptcy when that all hit? Were you even in a place where that was a, an option or a thought or a conversation? You know, I was always impressed with Ford Motor Company. When when GM and Chrysler and, and all the other companies would go and file bankruptcy, but Ford kind of held steady and somehow fought to the end to not. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Cirque du Soleil had filed bankruptcy and they were a lot stronger than we. I mean, that unbelievable company, right? And I just thought, you know what? Um, we got to fight till the end, like the 300 Spartans did. Um, I don't. I don't want Leonidas in his grave to turn over and say, "I can't believe I let Joe use our brand," and he fucking folded. <laughs> so, um, so I held on, and I'm still holding on to the very, very end. And you know, it looks like uh, it looks like we're going to make it, which somebody should do a documentary on because I don't even know how the hell we did it. Wow. Yeah. And so another one. Um, any plans to exit? You know, my, my motto for the last 12 years has been um, my exit strategy is death. So hopefully, knock on wood, hopefully I don't die anytime soon. But um, I, I'm, a, I'm just so unbelievably um, happy and, and excited that somehow I'm involved with this word Spartan and that helmet. And I think it, you know, not to sound hokey, when, when it's referred to by politicians in the Ukraine that these are our modern-day Spartans, right, holding up good against evil, or the Serbians, or, 
you know, you see it referenced in newspapers. I'm like, hey, we're carrying this brand. So, yeah, I mean, I could make a bunch of money and exit, but, um, but then what? Then what? Would I start selling handbags or flowers? Or what the hell would I do? Right? Like, like, <laughs> well, I know you're... You're a, you're a talented enough guy that, uh, and you've already proven it multiple times in, in other arenas that you would find something. I was just curious because after going through something that stressful and I, I, I see the work and effort and blood and sweat you put into all this stuff like that and can, can only imagine that you get tired and frustrated sometimes. But So you you see yourself riding, riding this Spartan thing all the way through. Uh, you don't have any desires to potentially do any other business ventures. And you want to you want to stick with it all the way to the end. Maybe you pass it down to the family. Even it sounds like. Yeah, on that twenty five mile run today, my friend, who's been my friend, like I said, from the mid nineties, we did all these races together, which allows you to have these deep conversations because you're trying to get your mind off the pain you're going through. And um, he was asking the same question, you know, where do you want to be 10, 15, 20 years? And I thought it would be awesome to have a, another CEO in place that's running the thing day to day, I'd still like to be the inspirator, the person that inspires folks to do hard shit. Um, I'd love to have a dozen different brands under the Spartan, you know, brand, which whether it's Tough Mudder or we've got a new hiking event. Remind me, by the way, guys, send me an email. We've got a hiking event called Highlander Adventures. Oh, wow. Oh, and, cool. um, uh, some ways less stressful than a, a run or an obstacle course. We got one at Big Bear coming up in September. Um, I'll get you guys a bunch of free entries to it. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome product. We've got DECA. So I'd like to have a dozen or so brands under the Spartan umbrella that are all um, really tough challenges and, um, and just teaching people how to, how to live a life where you, you test yourself and you do hard things. Um, in this society or any first world society where we have it as easy as we have it, um, we set ourselves up for failure, in my opinion, because when, when the shit hits the fan, when somebody in your family dies, I just had somebody die in our family a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, or go through it, right? A business busts, or you get divorced, or you got somebody uh, you're close to drinking or drugging or whatever. Um, if you've practiced hard, if you've done hard shit consistently, um, it's a lot easier to get through it. And the alternative sucks, by the way. Like, if you can't get through it, and then you find yourself, like so many people, drinking and taking Xanax. Um, that's not a good alternative. So, so yeah. Choose your hard, right? Yeah. Choose your hard. Yeah. How yeah. was the uh, response to your TV show? Is there any plans for another season? We're talking about it. Uh, response was pretty good. It didn't do as well at night as it did during the afternoon. There were a couple of afternoons where they ran it behind the motocross competition. And it did really, really well, which hmm. makes no sense at all because I'm not. <laughs> I, I used to race BMX when I was a kid, but I could I couldn't figure out that correlation. So within the giant NBC quagmire of shows and channels and everything else, they're just trying to figure out where they could put it to catch a draft, like they saw from motocross, which is very strange. <laughs> That's yeah, really interesting. interesting. Yeah. Well, Joe, I uh, I appreciate everything you're doing. Look forward to seeing you um, when we get up there, and uh, we'll definitely make sure that we we talk about it on the show leading up there. And then I would love to have Jimmy come on. So if we could have, if I don't know what uh, how hard that is to put that together, um, but he sounds like he's got some pretty interesting stories and be fun to talk to. So it'd be kind of cool to talk to him personally about his foundation. You would love um, Jimmy. Okay, cool, yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Well, so if you you and Katrina, if you guys could organize that so we could get Jimmy in here, that'd be great. Have Katrina text me. Okay. And then you, you can text me. I'll connect you on the Big Bear um, event, uh, Highlander Adventures. We should send a bunch of people on, you know, on us, no charge, to that event. How cool. far is Big Bear from you guys? That's uh, L.A., right? Yeah, That's L.A. area. Is that like four hours? Yes, yeah, probably like six hours. Away. Six yeah, hours? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not a big deal. Yeah. It's a so you, you must have a following that, that is out there, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. LA area right. is definitely one of the one of the big areas. Mm -hmm. You're awesome. All right, guys. All right, yeah. Joe. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it, man. Yep. Thank you. See you guys. See you. Hey, real quick, check this out. Electrolytes, very important for hydration, for athletic performance, but most electrolyte powders or drinks are too low in sodium. I'm not making this up. Sodium is the most important electrolyte for athletes. 
Well, there's a company called LMNT that we work with and that we invested in that makes electrolyte powder drinks, no artificial flavors, by the way, that has the appropriate amount of sodium. You notice a significant improvement in performance when you drink this before and during your workouts. I get better pumps in my workout. I get better hydration and better pumps. This is especially important for people who eat a diet that's low in processed foods and especially for low-carb dieters. When you eat low-carbohydrates, you need more hydration and you need more sodium. Go check this company out. This place is exploding. It's amazing. But also, you can get a free sample pack with any order if you get if you go through our code. So check this out. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. Any purchase gets you eight single serving packets for free with that particular hookup. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Shannon from North Carolina. Shannon, how's it going? How can we help you? Hey guys, I uh, just want to take a quick moment. Um, thank you for all you, what you do. Um, you guys literally like changed my whole freaking life. Um, I decided to quit my job a couple years ago after listening to you guys, I fixed up an injury. So now I am a personal trainer, um, nutrition coach, but I wanted to pursue more. So, um, I am enrolled in NCI and BCI. So all thanks to you guys. Um, so yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. That. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask my question and then um, I'll call, kind of go into um, some more backstory stuff. So my question is, how do you recover from a from binging excessively after a bikini competition? Um, it's a two part. And then how do you handle weak leptin and ghrelin signals post show or diet? So um, I competed in my first two bikini competitions um, in April of this last year. And like three and a half months ago, and uh, it was an eight-year goal of mine. And the reason why it took so long is because a I was injured uh, in the mil- so I was in the military, um, so I got injured in the Marine Corps. And then B I have a history of past eating disorder, and um, I just like mentally wasn't ready, physically wasn't ready, and I wanted to make sure I was both before I decided to pursue that goal. Um, hence why it took me eight years. Um, over time, uh, I just really wanted to make sure my like head was right going into it because I know that calories can get low. I know that girls can develop eating disorders from competing. And so I just wanted to make sure everything was good to go. So I reached out to a coach in 2020. Um, and that's when like we started the process. I made sure I was good to go. I was like so like excited and ready to tackle this. Um, so there was a lot of like history and a lot of, um, like, you know, full circleness of why I wanted to compete, um, going into my first prep in January of 2022. Um, I felt good, felt great. Um, and then, you know, right around like the three weeks out, that's when like things started to really hit me hard Four weeks out. Um, I knew that calories were going to get low. That's why, again, it took me so long to make sure like I was mentally prepared. Um, and I wanted to build up a lot of food before I started getting to a cut. So I didn't have to like get down to 800 calories, 1,000 calories. Um, but I was pretty close before show. And um, I just opened old doors with my eating disorder. Um, I started purging again. And um, it's been pretty difficult since I finished my second show. And, uh, so here we are in August and I'm just excessively binging. I feel like I can't control it. And, um, I feel like I don't have any, I feel like I have weak leptin and ghrelin signals. So, um, kind of seeking guidance on what I should do or how. Well, first off, Shannon, I want to, uh, thank you for your courage just to even talk about this on uh, a podcast like this. That's a big deal. And I know how vulnerable it can be to, or how you can feel to talk about uh, challenges like this, especially if you work in our space. I think a lot of trainers and coaches yeah. um, present an aura of perfection, thinking that'll make them a better coach or trainer. The truth is being vulnerable actually makes you a more effective coach or trainer. So I'm glad you, you're talking about this. The absolute worst possible thing somebody can do, or one of the worst things that someone can do who has a history of dysfunctional relationship with food is a show. It's like somebody who's a recovering alcoholic who then's like, I'm going to work in a bar, right? It's like, you're, you're just surrounded by these, by dis, you're surrounded by dysfunctional behaviors with food 
that is normalized because dieting for a show <clears throat> is for all intents and purposes dysfunctional. It really is. You're, you're, you're taking your body past the healthy point, especially those, you know, four weeks or five weeks before a show it's normalized and celebrated. And if you've ch been challenged with this in the past, you're like throwing yourself in the fire. So I would recommend you don't do those anymore. Um, that's my recommendation. The second thing is, um, you know, you asked about weak leptin and ghrelin. I wouldn't worry about that. This is all a relationship thing with food. It's it's 100% a relationship with food. Um, you know, I, I would have to work with you longer to help figure this out. And I would also recommend you work with a therapist, not a fitness and nutrition coach, but somebody who can talk about the root causes of this and, and how to work through them and also how to be able to deal with and handle the uncomfortable feeling that hunger presents to you and how you handle that. Or maybe the other uncomfortable feelings that tend to lead to this stuff. Now, post-show for most people, I tell people you need to be as structured after a show as you are going into a show in order to get yourself out of it. Because what people tend to do is they go into a show, then when the show's over, it's like, okay, cool, I'm just going to go back to normal. But you went into it extreme, and I'm not talking about you, I mean everybody, right? You went into extreme, coming out of it, you know, it's like um, it's like you're going 200 miles an hour, and then you expect your normal brakes just to slow you down. Like, you need to, you need to have a plan to slow down, just like you had a plan uh, going into it. And that's what I recommend to everyone, but... To someone like yourself, I would say this is the wrong thing to do. This doesn't mean you're weak. In fact, you're extremely strong because you're identifying this. You know what a lot of people do in your situation is they keep going back. Why? Because they're like, I got in shape for that show. Look how ripped I was. And I can't control myself. I need another show to bring back that control. And it becomes this addiction, this addictive, repetitive behavior. So the truth <laughs> is, and I, the reason why I'm saying you're strong is because you're a Marine you, you went into this, you're, you're putting this out there. And a lot of times what people say to themselves when they're challenged with this is, well, I don't want to not do a show just because, you know, I'm challenged with this. That means I lost. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're winning for admitting this and acknowledging it and talking about it. This is the, this is the strength part. The, the weak part is I'm going to keep going back and not acknowledge uh, this challenge and this issue. So I highly recommend you work with uh, in somebody who's an expert with dysfunctional eating, not a fitness coach, uh, not a nutrition coach, but somebody who works with this, um, a behavioral specialist or a therapist, work with them. Don't go back to doing this and then focus on working with your clients. You know what saved me more than anything? Because I had lots of body image issues. Uh, I still have some uh, and it's something I still deal with, but they were really bad when I was younger. What helped me the most was working with clients because I could always be better with my clients than I could be with myself. I cared so much about them that it was hard for me not to realize the hypocrisy and how I treat myself, right? So I'd have a client would present to me very similar issues and I'd give them great advice. And I do this so many times that I'd, at some point, like, why don't I take my own advice, you know? So I think working with clients is very therapeutic. Uh, it can be, and it can be very, very good for someone like yourself. So that's what I'm going to say. As far as the weak ghrelin and leptin signals, don't worry about your hormones and all that stuff. Do what's healthy, but it's your relationship to those things. So, you know, you 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 and someone else may feel the same or get the same signals from, you know, going on a diet, but your relationship and your experience with those signals is what makes it individual. So I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I did get a therapist because I didn't want to like go back in the rabbit hole of old ways, even though I opened like old doors, I didn't want to just kind of push it off to the side and not get help. And I actually gained a lot of weight when I got out of the Marine Corps. Um, I got up to 225. So it's 80 pounds more than I am right now. And because I kind of just like pushed it aside because I felt like, oh, if I talk about it or if I really deal with the problem, it's a sign of weakness. And like now it's, I don't want, I, I want to be a role model for my kids, the next generation. Yeah. My, um, it's funny. They bring up your clients. Um, my ICA is like Shannon at that point of like, you know, in the pitfall of her 80 pound weight gain. So, um, it's just really difficult because I did love competing. Um, but I feel like I know that I should probably, you know, it was like a one and done thing. Yeah. I, I I'm going to echo some things that, that Sal said. One, I, again, I, I commend you for coming forward and actually even talking about and sharing that. I think this is what's going to make you a great trainer. Uh, I think the fact that you have this uh, perspective that a lot of coaches won't have. Uh, I won't think, admit. 
Yeah, right? yeah, mm-hmm. won't admit or or don't even realize they have it. The fact that you recognize that you are going to be able to communicate and help out so many people. So I, I think that's amazing. Um, I, if you were, if you were my client, I would have never allowed you to do the competition. Um, and the, and I'm going to take the analogy Salgate with the 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 alcoholic going and getting a job at a bar. It's not even like that. It's like an alcoholic deciding I'm going to go on a, a weekend bender intentionally, and then I'm going to stop right afterwards. That's what it's more like because you have already been there before and it's not like you're getting a job at the bar. It's like you are, you are going to go in a dysfunctional place with diet. It's just, you have to, to get to those stage ready. And so you're basically saying I'm an, I'm an ex alcoholic. I'm actually going to go on a weekend or a two week bender. And then I'm going to decide I'm going to cut it off again. Like that's literally what's going on with dieting for a show for somebody who has had you know, struggled with a relationship with the food in the past. That's how unhealthy of an idea that would be for someone like you. I just wouldn't allow you to do it. I'd say it's just not a good idea for us to do that. Doesn't mean that we can't diet down and we can't work on getting ripped together. Like I, I would totally allow that with you, but you and I would be talking on a regular basis on how you're feeling, what's going on with you. Um, and even when we're doing just normal dieting, we'd have to have a plan to reverse out. And so that's part of, you know, what Sal was saying. Like when you when you went down that hard you you the end of the the diet for the show is, is not the end of the diet the actually end of the diet was two three four weeks later after that you would have needed to have mapped it out all the way to probably have any sort of success but i mean it's ama- i mean i think you look great right now so you obviously kept some of it in control for sure you're 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 much you didn't go back and do the 80 pounds back you know which could have could have happened easily from from something like this so yeah i i agree with what sal is saying 100 percent um, and I, I definitely wouldn't have wanted you to do a show, but you did. And I, I think it's now going to give you some tools to, to be able to communicate uh, the challenges that come with this. Because you know what? It was a battle that I was losing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm trying to help people now on this podcast at, at a much bigger scale. But I, I was blown away by how many and especially bikini competitors uh, were doing this to their body. I mean, you are actually more common than not common in that space. Totally. Many yeah. the people that are attracted to that way of dieting are people that are still struggling with their their eating, their eating. And the, and you at least are aware of it. A lot of them are just naive or don't want to look at it and they just keep show after show after show and just and and then these coaches, they they're making money off of helping these bikini competitors. So it's not in their best interest to try and truly help these, or they don't have the tools because they don't know. All they know how to do is push these these girls and these competitors to these extreme diets. So I mean, I think you are in an incredible place to really help a lot. I think there's a huge business mm-hmm. waiting for you just in that space of saving a lot of these girls that are probably still struggling with this. So totally. to me, and, and I think that is going to be some of your best therapy is to be able to to see that in others and recognize it because you know what it's like to go through it and feel it. And helping them is probably going to be very therapeutic for you while also you know, seeing a, seeing a therapist. I think those are things that are going to really help you. Shannon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. I think I know the answer, but uh, are you a, do you thrive in competition? Do you like, do you like doing tough things? Yeah. She's a Marine. She's a Marine. Yeah, I, she, I mean, it's like a rhetorical <laughs> question. Obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. And so so you I think that's probably the part of competing you like because it was it was hard. It was competitive. It was hard for you personally. It's hard for anybody. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna point you in a, in another competitive direction. Have you thought about competing in a strength sport like powerlifting? Yeah, powerlifting, I was thinking the same thing. You know, listening to you guys, I've like thought about it even more and more. Um they listen to you guys like religiously. Um, and I thought about, no, I haven't really, except for like more on the recent months, um, to answer your question. Oh, I, 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 I think would, I would love to see you. Do yeah. That. Now, and now that's not to say that, yeah. that powerlifting doesn't have its own dysfunction, yeah. every, every sport at extreme levels, but for someone who, who, you know, is challenged with body image stuff, it's very hard to, to you know, have a terrible relationship with food in the restricting aspect and also be strong, compete in powerlifting. things. very, it tends to be a healthy direction and it'll, it'll feed that competitive side for you. And it's actually, I think you'll enjoy it more because when you're on stage, it's very subjective who looks mm-hmm. the best or whatever. When you're powerlifting, you lift more than the other person you win. It's the bottom line. There's like, there's black and white. Who the strongest is that day is the winner. And then you're competing against yourself. Did I lift more than I did last time? So I don't care if I got fifth place, I hit a PR. I think powerlifting would be, a, if you, if as competitive as you are, 
I bet you would thrive in that space. It's a big shift of focus. I think you'd probably really enjoy being so competitive. So, and it's, you know, it's something that may, you know, come back to see like this, this is changing my body in a preferable way. Uh, but just focusing completely just on strength for a while, you know, might do your body a whole lot of good. Do you have maps power lift? I do not. Well, we're going to send you, that over. You got here. it now. We're going to send you maps power lift. <laughs> Under your chair. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to send you maps power lift. And then I want to send you maps prime too, just so that you could prime your body properly um, and prevent any injuries if you don't have that. Um, but I think that's the direction workout wise. Everything else you're doing uh, from, the, from the fact that you're aware, talking about it, mm -hmm. you said you're working with a therapist and you're coaching others, you're, in the right, you're going in the right direction. Shen, are you in our private forum too? Um, I want to say yes, but I'm not. Okay. Well, I'm going to put, I'm going to have Doug put you in there too. I just, I just yeah. love the fact that you've been open about yeah. this and shared it. I think there's people, one that you could help. It's very courageous. Of you and, sure. and there's other competitors that are in there that have actually had similar experiences as yourself. So I think there's a, it's yeah. a great community for you to be in. So I want to, and, and we're in there so we can keep a, keep an eye on you and you keep us posted how things are going. Totally. Also, uh, before we, we started this, we were off air, but we saw you on screen. We talked to you a little bit. Yeah. Would you mind showing everybody that cool ass tattoo? Come on. <laughs> so it's a stick figure that chugs beer mugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I was like, I got it when I was like 20 years old. Oh my gosh. So I, that's the most badass tattoo I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, awesome. Do you have any other way. questions or, or, or did we, did we give you kind of what you were looking for or help you out? No, I actually feel really good. I didn't even think about powerlifting. So you like, really open up my eyes a lot more. Um, I think I knew already the answer to my question before I came on and you guys just confirmed it. Um, so I'm just really excited. And to go back with the whole client thing, like, yeah, that's, I mean, everyone has a pain point of why they want to be a personal trainer and nutrition coach. And so I'm just really excited to like provide more guidance to my clients because I feel like it's not talked about a lot. And I think that that's why I wanted to come on here. I knew that this was going to be recorded live um, because it needs to be shared more that like there are other people like me too that are suffering and it's okay, but like, it's not okay to just ignore it and to just push past it. Um, quick Shannon, so, Shannon, thank you. real quick, give us your, your, yeah. your social media handle. Let's get you some clients. <laughs> um, it is Shan West fit S H A N W E S T F I T. Excellent. So. All right. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, Thanks for thank you, a lot of people. Appreciate Shane. it. Uh, that is very. I, I love the the vulnerability. That is a real tough thing to, on on a podcast. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, but she's doing the right thing. She's yeah. totally doing the right thing. Moving the right. That means training clients help me way more than I think it helps well, clients. Like you said, time. being vulnerable. I mean, that's that's really what um, you know. Clients, you can you can relate. You can get on that level where uh, you can actually make some serious behavioral change with your clients if they you know they they trust in you. You've had that experience yes. and you share it. Uh, it's just a lot more connection that you get with your clients totally. that way. I remember when that that I made that connection as a trainer. I mean, that really catapulted my business when I when I kind of looked at my peers and realized that all of us are a bunch of insecure dudes and girls. <laughs> yeah, dude. Seriously, everybody I know. has something. Man. And that we and we just have this shell that we've built, you know, yeah. and we put this facade on like we got it all figured out, but really we're inside we're as bad or worse than these clients that yeah, we're, we're helping. We're all struggling yeah. too. And then the, the minute I was able to to express that and share that with my clients. It just, I mean, it completely changed my relationship as a coach with all my clients in my business. And and I think it just gave me this edge versus all these other trainers because I think that they they put on this facade and yeah. what they don't realize is that the average and they think that they're being inspiring. No, and, they can't get relate. They yeah. can't relate. Yeah. And then, and that's just it. Is the people deep down they may think that oh yeah it's so motivational. See mm -hmm. that my buff. Well, initially trainer. they go there, right? yeah, but then it's not fulfilling, right? Next caller is Tiffany from Arizona. Hey Tiffany, how can we help you? Hi. Yes. So I um I currently am training jujitsu, and I recently just came off of a bodybuilding show. Um, I'm a blue belt in jujitsu, so I've been training for some time, and. I have, I kind of have a little bit of a problem transitioning from the jujitsu to, um, the bodybuilding and back and forth. And I kind of just wanted to see what you guys' take is on like how I can set up my training, um, while I'm training jujitsu 
to still be able to kind of help a little bit with uh, bodybuilding? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I have experience with this, and this was a, a a challenge for me. What color belt do you have? Purple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in case anybody's wondering, that was a purple belt. <laughs> Sorry, that's an inside joke. So uh, this this was a challenge for me too because um, when I would when I first started do, doing jujitsu, I obviously have a love for strength training, and uh -huh. I did I did too much of both, and I just fried myself. And I my first competition I lost, and so what I had to do is really reevaluate how I applied strength training in relationship to jujitsu. So this is, and this is, and then I trained competitors as well uh, after I started training. So um, I, I it, it, it's like this, right? If you do two or more days of jujitsu, two, three, four days of jujitsu, you're going to lift once a week. That's it. Once a week. If you're going to lift two or three days a week uh, uh, in the gym, you're doing one day a week of jujitsu. That's kind of the ratio. Now they do tend to help each other. Now, jiu-jitsu does use a lot of strength stamina, but it's not the kind of endurance that you would get from running. So you can actually maintain a decent amount of muscle doing jiu-jitsu. You're not going to maintain all your muscle doing high-level jiu-jitsu, uh, but you'll maintain a, a decent amount, more so than if you, let's say, were a runner or a cyclist or something like that. Um, but I'm okay. going to ask you this. Which one is more important? Yeah, I was going to say you? that's got to be the question here because it, no, something has to give in this situation. And if the hard part is when you want to be great at both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. Or are you going to go back and forth? Are you going to keep doing that? Yeah, so um, I so I used to compete a long time ago in the bodybuilding world, like 12 years ago when I was in like my mid-20s. And uh, I didn't do very well. I just didn't really have the right... Um, I guess just the right mindset and like not a very great coach either. So um, at the time, you know, I was just kind of car doing myself to death and I just got a little bit uh, like I, I love lifting. And so I spent the last 12 years lifting. And then about two and a half years ago, I started training jujitsu and jujitsu. Honestly, I love jujitsu more than I love the bodybuilding. However, I think a small part of me is a little bit vain and I like looking a certain way as well as being able to, um, train jujitsu and kind of, I guess, be a little bit of a badass. <laughs> yeah. How many days a week do you do jujitsu? Um, for three to four days a week. Like oh. I, I shoot for at least three. And then sometimes I try to get in like that fourth day of training and then I've been lifting. So I re I just had a show June 11th. Um, at like a bodybuilding show June 11th and at the transition but like transitioning out of that back into jiu-jitsu is a little bit difficult because I still feel like I'm like on this routine that I don't really want to give up where you know I my my diet stays kind of routine and my lifting stays kind of routine but like you said like I'm trying to do both and try to be good at both and I just want to be able to try to find like a happy medium so that I can still look good and also train jiu-jitsu at a higher level. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you really enjoy the lifting process and then, you know, the result of that in terms of your aesthetics, but do you really need to compete and go on stage and go through that bit of the process? Or can you just kind of cut that out, focus a little bit more on jujitsu and, and the skill of the jujitsu, but then also, you know, incorporate hypertrophy style training and like still keep in that sort of vein. But I think that we could work you know, a schedule a lot more efficiently with that, you know, in terms of like, instead of like going through that really super demanding, um, you know, dietary, uh, um, yeah, it's you know, competition is competition. Just, it's just extreme. I mean, I think you could, I think you could train jujitsu two to three times a week and lift weights full body one to two times a week and have a pretty damn Good looking physique. Well, yeah. and the, here's the other part of this, T Tiffany. You said you've been lifting for a long time. You know, yeah. it doesn't take a lot to keep what you have, right? So with when it comes to lifting. So you could, if you want to keep doing three, four days a week of, of, of jujitsu, I would go one mm -hmm. day a week. I do. I would focus on strength. I would do five core lifts and I would focus on lower reps. Just feel strong. Don't go to failure. And that'll keep a lot of your muscle and aesthetics. And then the jujitsu obviously is going to keep you pretty fit. Now, if you want to do a balance of both, I'd go two and two, two days a week, jujitsu, two days a week of, of, you know, of strength training. But if you're doing, if you keep doing what you're doing with the jits, just go one day a week to the gym, do five core lifts. That's when I had my best combination of physique and skill. That's when I, when I did it that way. Cause when I tried to throw more strength training at myself, it just, I would overtrain. Cause you know how it is. Like you go, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you do your two, two, three hour class of jujitsu with that last hour being where you're rolling and sparring. 
I mean, you're fried. It's 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 a completely different yeah. uh, tax on the body than than lifting. So, I mean, one day a yeah. week, literally one day a week, five core lift, four to five core lifts. Focus in the five rep range. Keep your intensity moderate. You're not going to failure. So you're doing squats okay. and overhead presses and rows and pull ups and that kind of stuff. Um, and I think you're going to feel amazing. What you don't want to do is push your body to the point where you feel kind of fried and sore and injured all the time. I remember feeling that way yeah. for a while. You want to feel fresh. And more than okay. one day a week of lifting with that schedule is is, is probably too much. Then the other part is diet. Let's. T I, I got to talk about this because I struggled with this because when it came when I was just lifting, I prefer a, a lower carbohydrate diet. I just have better aesthetics. I don't need a lot of carbs when I lift. Um, some, but not a ton. When I did jujitsu, my maximum, my best performance came from having more carbs. I needed the carbohydrates. Yeah. So I'm going to say, don't eat bodybuilding style, eat jujitsu style. So eat to fuel your body for jujitsu. And then one day a week of lifting in combination with what you're doing. And I think you'll be happy with, with what you see. Tiffany, do you have any of our programs? I don't No, I've always like, I've always followed you guys because I feel like I'm always learning from you guys. Um, but I've always just hired someone. So I, I hired one of the, the best coaches for the bodybuilding thing. And then I train with one of the best in the world uh, with jujitsu. So I've always just kind of tried to tag along and, and kind of do what they're doing, I guess. Well, the challenge with that is, you, okay, you have the best of the best in both those cases. They're going to give you the best advice for that for each of their for things. That one thing, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think the advice here is, is what Sal's saying, I think is great advice, which is either the two and two split, or if you're you're gonna be more heavy in the jujitsu doing three days a week or four days a week of jujitsu and then just one day of strength training. And I think a perfect program for that is MAPS anabolic. So you take and okay. you, and you would just follow one of the days. So it's a full body routine. It's focused on most of those core lifts that Sal was talking about. And you could just literally pick one of the the foundational days. So just follow that. Um, at one day a week and and you could actually play with this by the way so even though we he said you know two and two or if you're doing three days of jiu-jitsu you only do one day you could actually some weeks you could put two days like, like let's say you're going along and you're doing three days of jiu-jitsu one of training three weeks go by and you feel like ah you just don't maybe you don't you feel like you're losing muscle and you don't kind of like your look and you're like you know i'm gonna scale back on jiu-jitsu and pick up one day of lifting and now you're going to okay. go two days. Yeah, away. totally flexible. So you could totally be flexible with it. Doesn't You don't have to be rigid where it's like, oh, the guy said one day a week of lifting, three days of jitsu, and then you just have to stay consistent that way. If you don't like what you're seeing and you feel like mm -hmm. you're losing the all that muscle you worked so hard to have, then pick it up to two days a week and then scale back a little bit on jitsu. Just be, be cognizant of what you're doing to your body and listen to what it's telling you if you're really sore or you're you're lagging in jiu-jitsu because you're overtraining from the from the lifting and just try and have a little mm -hmm. bit of balance there just but it does not take that much to Sal's point you've been lifting for a really long time especially at the a, a high enough level where you've competed and got on stage that means i know you probably have a pretty good volume of training over years so mm -hmm. You 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 hitting weights good one day a week on the good core lifts and staying strong. You'll you'll be surprised how much muscle you'll you'll Here, maintain. Here's a mistake a lot of people make too: is they try to build jujitsu stamina and endurance in the gym. Don't do that. So don't go okay. to the gym and then do a bunch of circuits and a bunch of complexes and a bunch of that kind of stuff. You're gonna your best endurance and stamina is gonna come from training jujitsu. Go to the gym and lift and do and use the weights for what they're best for, which is strength. Yeah. So I, I mean, and I did this with a lot of the people I worked with. Uh, we would go and we do like you know five reps, and we would do multiple sets of a few you know compound lifts, and then that had the best carryover. When we would go and do supersets and giant sets and complexes, and we'd get real tired and all oh, this is going, we'd end up seeing our performance decline mm. in jujitsu was just too much. So, you know, yeah. stick to those core lifts, do the, you know, keep it low reps, just get strong, keep, st stay strong, and then you'll, you'll do okay. Yeah. Do you ever That's take an off season? Oops, sorry. Do you ever, do you do this year round or do you ever take like a good chunk of time off and just focus on strength training exclusively? Um, so I did recently, I kind of just decided because I did really well, like back in November, I decided to jump into a bodybuilding show because jujitsu had gotten me lean, but I was still lifting um quite a bit i think i was lifting maybe three days a, a week when b b before i started to do the bodybuilding show and then i was doing jujitsu uh five days a week so i was i was doing it a lot and um i was pretty lean so i was like oh i'm gonna do another show and i'm gonna do it different this time and i got on stage and i did really well and then of course you get kind of 
bitten by the bug when you start winning. Right. And so I was like, right. oh, I just want to keep doing these bodybuilding shows and I'll st- keep training jujitsu. But then your body stops reacting the way that it kind of needs to. And that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. So this past time, I just decided to take a step back and I kind of took a break. We went on vacation. I didn't do anything. I let my body kind of heal. But now I'm back and I'm finding myself kind of like, okay, well, what should I do? Like, how often should I train jujitsu? How much should I be lifting? Do I want to do bodybuilding again? Can I be good at both? So but you guys' advice has been already really helpful. Perfect. Great. Yeah, you're in a good space. I could tell. You're, yeah. I mean, you. I think it's totally fair to love two different things. That totally. just yeah. 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 And you can have balance, and, and you could totally adjust what we've said as you go along. So really, just try and listen to your body. You obviously know you were overdoing it by five days of jujitsu and three days of lifting. That's just way too much, and the body obviously told you that. And so, just scale back a little bit, and and you can and you can adjust that as we go through. So. You know, every couple of weeks, check check in with yourself. And if you like what you're seeing or you don't, then adjust. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, Tiffany. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for all the information you put out. It's so helpful to me. And I know thousands of other people. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Good luck right with jiu-jitsu in, in your competitions. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, serious question. Yeah. What is the order of the belts? I, I don't know. I know so, I, there's I, few belts in jiu-jitsu. So there's only a few. It, it takes a long time to go up. So you go white, blue, purple brown, black. That's it. Oh, that's it. Yeah. So if you're purple, you're an instructor essentially, mm. uh, brown and black, like you're, so it's really, it takes a long time. So it takes, oftentimes it takes a year and a half, two years just to get a blue belt and then another year and a half or two to get a purple mm. belt. So we don't do the stripes like uh, they, Taekwondo. Some schools do that, mm. but the traditional is like, you just go blue, purple. And some guys, some people will be 10 years in jujitsu, stay at a purple belt. Part right. of, part of that is they just want to go compete and beat <laughs> new purple belts in competitions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah. Is that right? Really, so why, okay, what do you have to do? I know this is totally not related to Tiffany, but I'm so curious right now because we thought we brought the, we'll the belts. Back. Yeah, we'll yeah. come back to Tiffany in a second. <laughs> so what do you have to do to get to the next belt? That's up to, to the, that's up to your instructor. So the, the more you compete, the faster you'll probably move up because you can display your skill. You have to be consistent. You have to show technique and skill, mm-hmm. um, control, understanding of movement. You know, those are the things that your coach or your, your sensei. Oh, so it's completely at. decided by him. hundred percent. Yeah. He's, but th- there's a lot riding on them too. They're not going to promote somebody too quick. Right. It's a reflection. A hundred percent. And right. jujitsu is very traditionally very, very, they, they don't give out belts very easy. In fact, some of the oldest schools, it's like, you ain't getting a belt unless you really prove yourself. Right. I imagine because you're representing their, their dojo or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, you yeah. want, you want to make sure that they're badass if you gave them yep. that, that, that stamp. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I felt this is just a trap. A lot of people fall into where it's, yeah. you don't train optimally. You train to the max you can handle, mm-hmm. which is not optimal. I did this for a while. I was lifting. I'd I would do jujitsu on Saturday. Then I'd go to the gym and lift another two hours. Well, can you imagine her situation too? She literally went out, hired the best bodybuilding coach and she's got like yeah, one of the best. It's so conflicting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, jujitsu guys like telling her everything she needs to do to be the best jujitsu person. You know, the bodybuilding totally. coach telling her everything she needs to be the best. Her in half. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you're, the truth is you're not going to be the best at both those things while trying to do both, but you could be really good yeah. in both those categories, but you just got to learn to kind of balance. Yeah. It it's out. like, do, you, do if you want to compete in one, well, you got to take it seriously. And that's yeah. what I had to do at some point. But then another point, I'm like, I'm not going to compete anymore. So then I balanced it. Well, and two, both being sports, I'm always like thinking and challenging. That's why I asked about off season. It's like, you know, for some reason that's not in, in the mindset of, you know, how they're like planning out their programming and everything. Yeah, it's like everything point. is just like, oh, I have to take on this. Like every week I got to get better and better by adding more and more and more instead of, you know, reducing it down, just focusing on like building your body up, like, and taking all that time for your body to recover and get strong. Super good point. In, in, in jujitsu off season would be, I'm just going to go and roll light and go super easy. Perfect. Right. With lifting, yeah. you could take it off completely. Yep. Um, 100%. Great. That's a, a great take. Our next caller is Doug from Illinois. Doug, what's happening, man? How can we help you? How you doing, guys? Good. So uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for putting out real information regarding health, fitness, wellness, and nutrition. Um, you don't see that a lot these days. A lot of misinformation out on the website. So definitely appreciate what you guys do. And just keep it up. I can't look for I me. Mean, I can't wait to look forward to see what you guys are going to come out with next. Um I've used anabolic performance and prime pro love the programs. I use prime pro regularly. Um, I'm a disabled combat veteran did two tours in Afghanistan. Just recently had a hip replacement of August 5th of last year from when I got hurt over there. 
Um, been a continuous lifter for about 15 years, pretty great shape. Um, I keep straining my intercostal muscles. That's kind of what my question is going to go to. Um, I'm going to do a power lifting meet next May. And, um, like if I just bend over and pick up my four month old son, like it feels like something in my middle of my back beneath my shoulder blade, kind of by the spine just keeps popping. And then that pain is excruciating. So I didn't know if there was anything you guys could Tell me, guide me to on how to strengthen the intercostal muscles or mobilize. Yeah, that's okay. So that happens to me. It used to happen to me all the time too. Exact same, didn't, exact same didn't, spot. Didn't Ben Pollock do a really good video on this on our, our YouTube channel I don't, a long time ago? Did intercostals? I thought I'm not did. sure. We'll see if we can find that. Yeah, we'll um, I know he did some core plank stuff that he talked about in there. And well, obviously that's going, that. that's going to support So that. I worked with uh, a really, really good movement specialist on this because uh, I, was, I remember one day I was doing dumbbell pullovers and I pulled my intercostal so bad. I literally rolled off the bench, laid on the floor. Oof. And I, yeah, and I just sat there for like an hour. And I got on the phone, called this guy. He was he was so nice enough to come to to see me, and he we identified that I I didn't breathe properly. I don't breathe fully. So these muscles they expand and stretch and contract uh, when you take a breath. Um, mm -hmm. And because I was always tense, and I'd hold my tension in my rib cage, mm -hmm. my diaphragm wouldn't fully expand. These muscles were always tense. And then when I do a heavy exercise, I would stretch this stretch this muscle. It would go beyond its ability to control itself. So it's like any other mobility issue, right? Um, and it right. would pull. I'd pop it, pull. And I'd hear it pop, and then it would be just be nasty. Yeah. And it'd have to, you know, it would take me a couple weeks to get better or whatever. So um, I would look at your breathing. I would focus on belly breathing and and, okay. and really focus on being able to expand the rib cage, expand the belly, and then contract them and, and teach them to relax. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I'll recommend, we have till next May, right? That's, that's when you said the powerlifting competition is? Yeah, like I said, I kind of wanted to give myself almost two years between the hip replacement, you know, um, definitely a little bit weaker in my right side. That was kind of, I didn't know if that would lead to kind of the pain in the mid back, you know, kind of being a little off balance, I guess you could say, because my left side is definitely more stable than my right side. Okay. Um, well, I'm so gonna, I didn't know, if that. just kind of want to let you guys know everything so you can have the best information. I, I want you to do map symmetry, Doug. I All want right. you to, I want you to do map symmetry um, now. And go slow and control the movements. You allow, let the weaker side dictate what the stronger side does. Focus on right. your breath mm -hmm. with each rep. Okay, so kind of focus on that. You may notice that you're tight with your breath if you if you haven't noticed already. Um, yeah, and I, I have asthma from being over in Afghanistan, being around all those burn pits. I actually just got diagnosed with asthma. So they just put me on some Simbicorp. So I've actually been able to tell I've been a little bit breathing a little bit better since then. So th that might have led to it too. Oh, wow. Okay. So mm -hmm. I hit the nail on the head, I think. So yeah. remember, these muscles support your rib cage. And if mm -hmm. you're, in my case, it's just where I held my stress, the, it's like everything wants to stay tight to protect, right? Because what's, right. what's underneath your rib cage is your heart. It's a vital, you got vital organs, your lungs. So everything stays tight there. And so anytime I'd expand it beyond its capability to, to, to be stable, especially under resistance, I would end up injuring myself. So um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that uh, Ben Polk did a really cool video. I believe what we did was we asked him to give us like his, his how he warms up to get ready for his like heavy lifting. Oh, cool. And I think he does some really cool plank and breathing techniques. I'm pretty sure. Doug, are you looking for it right now? Oh, I Hard thought day. I had it. Yeah, I thought I had it posted there. Did it's, you find it, Andrew? Yes, on Mind Pump TV. It's the best way to breathe for maximum power and oh, strength. Oh, beautiful! There, there you go. It's a so, cool. It's a awesome, man. yeah. Watch I've that. I on you guys there for. I love love that guy. Yeah, yeah. No, he's got he's got a great. Yeah, if you're not already following him, for sure be following him because he does a lot of cool stuff for, uh, around that. And yeah. I think that'll that video I think will help you and a good video for you to kind of yeah. get ready into your lifts. Doug, we're gonna send you map symmetry because I think that's the workout you should do. But I'm gonna tell you something else about. Uh, proper breathing. If this is indeed the case with you, you'll know you're doing it right because when you start doing it, you're going to start feeling emotions come up. I know that sounds kind of hokey and whatever, but right. if if your if your breathing is is compromised because of whatever issue, once you allow that breathing to happen, it's gonna you're gonna unlock uh, emotions that maybe haven't been processed or whatever. So sometimes with clients, I would have them breathe properly, mm -hmm. and they get they'd start shaking or they'd get the chills. I had people cry before. I felt really weird doing it myself. So if you if you start to feel emotions pop up, you're doing it right. Okay. So don't shy away from that. You know yeah, you're doing yeah. it. You know you're doing some of these right. But map symmetry will be the workout. I think that'll be up the perfect for you. Awesome. Hey man, I definitely appreciate it, man. Like I said, you guys are 
I always tell everybody, I always refer everybody to you guys. They're always asking me, you know, advice and stuff. And I'm like, I, I learned most of my stuff from Mind Pump. I'm watching you guys for about five, six years now. Even even back when some of your guys' episodes were as good as they are now. No offense. <laughs> Sparkly taints. Wait, we have we have an extra love for people that have stuck around that long, dude, yeah, for sure. You really like hey, it. Man, you guys put out real information, man. Like I said, you see a lot of hokey pokey stuff. My girlfriend's one of those TikTok, Instagram, and she sees some of that stuff on there. And I'm like, that is such BS, baby. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she, she calls you guys my boyfriends. You know, so I watch you. So. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you a big kiss yeah, through this, exactly. through this uh, <laughs> internet here. Hey, I, 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 I appreciate your service too, Doug. Thanks for calling in. That's right, man. Thank you. I, I appreciate you, fellas. You guys keep it up, all right? All Thank right. You. Thanks, Doug. You guys, you guys remember the first time you had a client belly breathe and they – they cried. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, I didn't really know what to do. I, I, don't, I don't do well with that stuff. <laughs> just, just, I, just I backed you. away you real just, slow. Just, and I was just like, start crying. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna go get some water. Uh, you just see Justin trying to do it. Do you want a towel or something? I yeah. felt the same way, bro. Yeah, I had so I it's had real though. Totally, yeah. dude. I yeah. so I I had somebody teach me this. I had a client do it. They started crying, mm -hmm. and I was like, uh. I don't know what to do. Like, did what you, do I do? Did you guys ever see that uh, the Wim Hof documentary when he does that, where he brings everybody in? Oh, yeah. And they're yeah. like, everybody's all crying and Dude, stuff like that. They're, yeah. they're crying. They're having some kind of like psychedelic experience from it sometimes. It's like, it's pretty crazy and powerful. Yeah. Your body stores that shit and, it, and it ha it's a part of the processing. And if you don't process, it stays there yeah. until you let it out. When you let it out, it's connected to emotion. And then that shit comes out. Well, I now. knew we had a really good video because I remember going to see Ben and I remember we, and I think it's a long video. Is it not? Is it a long one? Andrew, Doug? I'm trying to see how long it is here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure what we asked him to give us is like, hey, when well, you Ben's get, always very. It's seven minutes and 33 yeah, seconds. Like yeah, like we, we asked him, like, when you get ready detail. to get into your lift, your heavy lifts, what's your your pri like your like priming look like or how do you get prepared? And I do remember him doing like this plank and focusing on breathing and how he. He had this whole little part to warm up how important it was to get his breathing right before he went into his lifts. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So that, that'll that be extremely valuable for him. Yeah, to, but to, I think symmetry will be perfect. Too, oh, that too. Is, I agree, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, see, slow yeah. everything down, really controlled breathing totally. and all that. It's going to do a lot. Our next caller is Michael from Texas. Hey, what's up, Michael? How can we help you? How's it going? Um, I am a 22-year-old uh, newlywed who uh, just got out of being sick for a week. And, uh, before that I was running a push pull legs, uh, split. And so got married that the day after we got sick. Um, and so I got out of it and went straight into a cut. Um, so after listening to y'all, I was like, maybe I should move from doing my push pull legs, working out six days a week. Maybe this is a perfect opportunity getting back into the gym um, to, uh, go into three full body workouts the way that y'all say. Uh, and so I went into doing that and y'all have on y'all's YouTube channel, you guys have, uh, y'all's, uh, maps anabolic on there. And so, or f the phase one of it. So I was like, I'll just try this out and I'm trying it out right now. Today just did my second, um, my second my second, uh, workout. Uh, and so I got to thinking, I was like, if, if I'm working out going from six days a week to three days a week, um, is my metabolism going to adjust and just drop way down and then I'm going to gain body fat percentage or am I wrong about that? Yeah. No, if you build muscle, it'll, it'll, it'll go in the opposite direction. You'll, you'll burn, you'll get a faster metabolism. Whatever's going to build muscle on your body is more, is going to be better in that particular case. Um, but don't forget there's trigger sessions with anabolic as well. So on those right, days off right. in between, you know, you're doing three trigger sessions a day, so you're still active. Right. And also it's right. not like on those days off, we, re you know, we recommend you just sit around. I think you should still walk right. and be active on those days. But if this programming yeah. works better for you, which it probably will for about 85% of people, full body workouts, seem to be better. It's going to go in the opposite direction. You'll build more muscle and find that you're burning more calories. Yeah. You're probably thinking that way because you're, you're moving less because you're not going to the gym as much that you're, you're, Oh, am I going to be burning way less calories? Well, first of all, uh, a weightlifting, you know, workout is pretty minimal as far as calories in comparison to you just walking around. Like you walk, if you were to walk around for an hour and then you would compare the amount of calories you actually burn in a weightlifting session, 
the difference is is minimal. And if your body responds, like Sal is saying, to a three day a week lifting routine better than it responds to a split, you're going to end up building more muscle, which is only going to speed your metabolism up. So, I mean, pay attention to how you feel. I mean, it, a lot of this has a, mostly to do about diet. Yeah. So, is is your diet in check? Are you tracking your macros? Are you are you paying attention to your protein intake? What is your what, are you doing any of that stuff? Yeah. So I have a, uh, a calorie tracker. And so, um, I eat 1.1 grams of protein per pound of body weight right now, since I'm going to cut. Um, I noticed that I do a lot better with a lower carb, higher fat. So that's what I'm going with right now. Um, my maintenance calories are 3,100, about 3,100. And so I am at 2650 or sorry, 2450. Uh, right now is what I'm in. And I was going to run that for four weeks and then go into, um, go see what my body, well, I wanted to see what my body looked like after that and see if I wanted to probably go into a bulk after that. But the thing that I'm not too sure about, I just use y'all's macro calculator on y'all's mind pump macro website. And that's what gave me the 3,100. Um, and so I put in that I was going to the gym seven to, or it said, hours of activity, seven to nine hours a week. And so that's what I clicked because that's a, about what I was in the gym for, but I'm a landscaper. So I'm mowing five days a week, eight hours a day. And it's not just being on a mower. I'm weed eating, walking around on a blower in and out of flower beds, pulling stuff out, digging holes. I'm active all day. And so I wasn't sure if that would affect if I'm under consuming on calories possibly because when I was in my bulk, um, about a month ago, uh, I was, I was like eating more and just seeing how I felt and eating more and eating more. And my body felt content, um, at about 4,100 calories. And so I don't know if I'm under consuming calories. The signs that you'll, that you need to look for are energy, Strength, loss of strength, loss of muscle. Now, the calculator that you're talking about is a is an estimate, but there's a wide okay. there's a there's could be a wide uh, variance between individuals. So base it off of your own how you feel, how's your strength, how's your body fat percentage. Those are the things I would base it off of. So, are you under consuming? I mean, the questions I would ask you are: How you feel? Are you is your strength okay? Are you losing muscle? Are you gaining muscle? If if you're losing muscle and you don't feel a lot of energy, you're probably eating too little. Okay. Yeah. That's yes. This week, sorry about that. Um, this is my first week, like lowering my hours of activity mm -hmm. at the gym. So, uh, this week I feel, I mean, granted it's only day three, but I feel great. Um, when I was running the push pull leg split that, um, I just made them um, on my own, uh, my own workouts and stuff. I, I felt really drained at work. So it works best for me with my schedule to work out first thing in the morning and then go to work and all, all day at work. I just felt like I had no energy, uh, but lowering the amount of workouts I've done, I have noticed that or full workouts that I've done in a week so far, I've noticed that my energy is a lot better. Um, and I do feel stronger at the gym. Now, uh, I was able to push some, some pretty good weight today. Uh, so I was happy with my performance in the gym. I was just worried about my, uh, my metabolism no, going out of whack. If you're no. getting stronger, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, no, you're going to be all right. Now, let me, did you write your own three day a week program? No, no, or no, you he, saw, he got maps anabolic phase one from YouTube. You know how we put out like some, yeah, but let's give him the full program though. Oh yeah. That's just a teaser. It's like a five day teaser. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, Doug will send you over the full maps and a bog program. Just follow it to a T bro. You're, yeah. I think you're, and then, you know, check back with us in a month or two and I, I, I bet you're going to be feeling great. So it sounds like you're already heading down the right path. And I, based off of how much yeah. activity you have all day long, I really think that a three day a week lifting full body is going to serve you a lot better than a, you know, five or six day body part. Totally. Split Especially training. with the landscaping. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, and then along the lines of that so with the anabolic i noticed that or i've heard y'all talk about you can do like you can move from barbell to dumbbell there's a variation for that um i'm working away from i hurt my back and i slipped a disc um adam you've talked about 
the guy on YouTube, um, what is it? Uh, Squat University. Yeah. And so I've watched a few of his videos and today actually was the first time deadlifting in probably two months. Um, I only did 135 on the bar, but bending over last week would hurt my back. And so just moving any weight with the deadlift this week, but I was really happy with, but I'm not comfortable with a barbell yet again. Uh, I was really comfortable with a barbell, but right now it's just, I don't feel comfortable doing barbell back squat. So I've been doing split squat. Is, is that an, an okay switch over? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it, you can go trap bar deadlifts if you want, or don't do deadlifts at all. Uh, for the time being until you feel comfortable or do a single leg deadlift. Yeah, do unilateral work for a bit. Yeah. Like single leg deadlifts and, and just focus on, you know, your form and control. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, that's something that, you know, you're, you're just going to keep, uh, it's going to keep coming up if you don't address it. After you follow in a bog, then I would go to symmetry based off what you just said. So oh, yeah, exactly. That's a good follow-up program. So after you do anabolic, we're going to send anabolic your way. I think you should follow that. It does have a dumbbell mod in there so if there's there's times where you you don't want to do the barbell work and you'd rather do dumbbell work it's in there for you to choose from that uh go ahead and follow that do that for a while see how your body responds to just going to three days a week full body and then i think a great follow-up program would be map symmetry totally okay all right. perfect all right man thanks for calling in yes sir thank you, you got thanks it, for man. having me on guys you got everything y'all do is y'all help a lot of people out there and y'all just have a wealth of knowledge that uh everybody that listens to y'all show is so blessed to hear. So oh, thank, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you man. very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm glad you said what you said about the calorie burn. People focus so much on that. It's that's so, it's so down the pole, the, the bottom of the list. Especially of that was before I even heard what he did for work. Yeah. yeah. Sure, I mean, the, the burning calories all day. Oh yeah. yeah. The amount of calories he burns all day long. The difference between him lifting the three days less is nothing, nothing. from a calorie yeah. perspective. Yeah. 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 It's no big deal whatsoever. It's and it's, a, it's totally true. It's like you, if you just walk all, if you walk for an hour, you'll burn more calories than most you'll be strength training workouts. You would. It'd have to be a pretty intense strength training workout for it actually to exceed what a full, like, because you don't, like, when you do a strength training, you rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those rest periods are enough for those heart rate, that heart rate to come down again. Totally. And it's, and I've done this before where I'm like, I looked at my calorie burn in an hour and it just, in a typical, not a crazy intense, but also not like a light, easy workout. And then compared it to, I just go for a walk for an hour. Yeah. And from a calorie burn perspective, it's almost the exact same thing. It's crazy. It's the least important thing with your workout is how many calories you burn. Yeah. Hey, look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.